Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome again to another movie review with myself, uh, Betwixt, and Blackbird9. Uh, I'll just introduce you to the guys first. Betwixt, how are you doing? I'm fine, Bryzer. Uh, thanks yeah. very much for presenting this. I'm yeah, no problem. really looking forward to discussing this film. Yeah, it's me too. Uh, it's uh, it, it certainly is one of those films that just hits you. There's not, there's not, a, there's something about this film, and there's a lot in it. So, over to you, Blackbird. Good to talk to you again. How are you doing, sir? Greetings, good sirs. Thanks so much for having me back on the panel. Yes, I am definitely <laughs> looking forward to this discussion. I've got some several buckets of rocks here of going through this film and supporting documents. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot to talk about at many, many levels here. So yes, yeah. thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, we're recording this on Saturday, the 23rd of March, 2024. And um, the movie that we're going to be reviewing tonight is one that's well known to a lot of people in our circles. Uh, other people might know it, but if you haven't seen it, please do. Uh, but it's, I'll just warning, it's not a family entertainment type of show, okay? Or, or film. <laughs> this is kind of dark, deep, and it's disturbing in many ways. It's called Eyes Wide Shut. In 1999, uh, it's described as an erotic mystery psychological drama film directed, produced and co-written by the, the legendary Stanley Kubrick, who's no longer with us, who actually died just a few days after this uh, movie was made. And we'll go into that about what we think might have happened there. And it's based on a 1926 novella, Trom Novel, which uh, they say means dream story by Arthur Schnitzel. And... Um, the plot centers on a doctor, Tom Cruise, plays a doctor, and he's shocked to find out when his wife, uh, who played by Nicole Kidman, uh, reveals that she had contemplated having an affair 12 months earlier, and um, he goes off <clears throat> goes off thinking about things, and then uh, he ends up in a very, uh, very uh, unsavory place, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go into all of that. Uh, as I said, the... Um, Tom Cruise there, he plays Dr. William or Bill Harford, Nicole Kidman and his wife, that's Alice Harford. And actually the two of them were married in real life at the same time. Uh, Sidney Pollock as Victor Ziegler, Todd Field as Nick Nightingale. Um, and there's other names there which people might know, but they're, they're the main uh, characters in this, the most well-known actors. So I'll go, I'll go around the table then, um, betwixt your, your first impressions of this one. I mean, uh, but just for me first, uh, I'll just say that uh, I've seen this quite a few times. And when I saw it first, it, it really hit home. There was just something very disturbing and dark about this. It's it's slow moving that the piano music in it and everything is just, it, it pulls you in. And you're just kind of left wondering, whoa, whoa, whoa. It, it's like, kind of a horror movie, but without any of the blood and guts, if you know what I mean. But you know there's this evil lurking in the background all the time. And it's just amazing how the whole film just develops. And so again, it's only lasts over a period of a few days. It's Christmas time around in New York. And uh, <clears throat> it's just interesting how the whole thing develops. So betwixt, anyway, I'll hand over to you for your take on it anyway, your first, uh, your first impressions of it. Sure. I saw this film about 15 years ago, now, when I say I saw it, I watched the first 15 or 20 minutes of it, and then I got bored and I didn't watch any more. I'd heard people mentioning it. I'd heard them saying that, I don't know, was it one of the only films, or maybe there was another one where, you know, uh, Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise are together. But yeah, it's uh, watching it then, I don't know, maybe two years ago. I was taken aback because I hadn't seen the scene that we'll get into soon enough where all the people are in costumes and masks. And uh, it's like there's a completely hidden world that many of us are unaware of. I should say as well that I, I read a little bit about the, the making of the film. And I think Kubrick, he spent something like 400 and something days shooting this film. And I can imagine that would take its toll on anyone. Uh, seemingly, he died of a heart attack in his sleep not long after the filming had finished. Uh, there was a lot of editing. I'm sure, Bryzer, you'll get into that towards the end. But yeah, it's a, it's a very good film. 
as Bryzer said, it's slow moving. There's a sinister tone. You get this piano music constantly uh, playing. And it's a film about desire, uh, sexual desire. And in this film, many of the characters are desperate for sex, practically, from uh, a woman, a middle-aged woman whose father has died, to a homosexual uh, bellboy or whatever in a hotel. Every character seems to be dying to get it. And uh, it's a very dark film in that way. It's kind of, you know, it kind of turns humans into, into animals without any sort of morality. And that's all I'll say for now, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's true. The, the sexual overtones in this film are, are, are very, it's, it's in your face. And uh, a lot of nude scenes as well. So I'd say for people watching, it's not for kids. OK, this is deadly. This is an adults only movie. So, but there is, as you say, uh, prostitutes are in there. You know, there's a lot, as I say, uh, a lot of nude scenes. Is that they, Everyone, it's all about sex and the two, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, the two, the, you know, Bill Harford and his wife, that's, you could see it when they go to that Christmas party and it all kind of kicks off from there. Like it, you can just see it developing from there where he's meets these two girls at the party and they're chatting them up and it's like, yeah, do you want to have a good time? And then Nicole Kidman gets um, chatted up by this older guy who, you know, wants to see her again and all the rest of it. And, but nothing happens there. But uh, we'll, I just got my own idea what you know what uh, what was going on here, um, but I'll come back to that later. I'll just go to Blackbird first to get his first impressions. Yes, uh, just to reiterate one more time, <laughs> this is a very adult theme movie. This is a very disturbing adult theme movie, and discuss the things that we'll have to discuss today in the review of this aren't really family friendly programming so people that listen to my material you know this is definitely not you know for our yellow buckets and our orange buckets our orange buckets of course are you know birth to eight years old uh, yellow buckets are uh, nine years old to 17 year old. You need to be at least a white bucket 18 or over to be listening to this. So if you're not 18, don't, don't listen to any of this and don't get mad at me when I start talking about that dirty stuff. But <laughs> that this is, like you said, it is a film about sex and sex dynamics. And when we look at things from a game theory perspective, you know, one of the things about any Stanley Kubrick movie you learn is everything that is in that scene is there for a reason. He is not only telling a story, but he is telling a meta story. So everything in those very, you know, densely packed, you know, scenes in every Stanley Kubrick movie are there for a reason. So you go through like a cryptographer uh, when you're watching Stanley Kubrick movies. And a lot of people think they're boring because there is so much information overload that you know you start nodding out because your brain's frantically trying to connect all these patterns that, he, that he's putting together at all these different levels and you know you just have to get into this idea this is a different type of cinematography uh you know, like the first time you know you try to see uh, barry linden you know it was you know does this movie ever going to end kind of thing right uh, but you then you realize that, oh, he's doing this, 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 and this. And, you know, the uh, one of the things, I guess, is also from the game theory perspective is that you're looking at two very different systems living in the same place, but one is completely oblivious to the existence of the other this idea of a complete shadow universe that exists 
uh, right under everyone's noses. And this is the thing, you know, we talked before about my history with the Freemasons back when I was a young man and thought being a Shriner was something to aspire to. And then I realized what the Freemasons were. Um, but this idea of, you know, uh, a different world of initiates that have a blood oath that they can kill you if you reveal the existence of this hidden world. And the other thing is, you know, this, uh, anytime you go, uh, you know, see a Stanley Kubrick movie, go back to the source documents. What is this based on? And like Breiser was saying, this was originally from a 1926 novella by Arthur Schnitzler. And, you know, this guy was, you know, in the 1800s, um, you know, right in to not only the big Zionist movement, but the big counterculture of the Zabatian Francus about just total debauchery, you know, uh, the idea of redemption through sin and this idea of this initiated sex cult world was being pushed through by the Jewish intellectuals, you know, at like at the Frankfurt School, et cetera. But this is what they were trying to do is to say, you know, our system of just total debauchery is much better than this system of Christianity. And so uh, one of the big things is, you know, Kubrick just slams that in your face by saying, you know, this is going to be set at Christmas, which is something I don't believe the original story was done. And the way it just debauches Christmas. And all I could think about was in the Doctor Who reboot after 2005, where they had the recurring theme of a New England where every Christmas is last Christmas and they're just really pushing all this debauchery and, you know, uh, diversity, et cetera, in the Doctor Who universe and saying this is better. And, you know, and, you know every Christmas is last Christmas and that's the whole theme. And so, yeah, we'll talk a lot more about the Christmas theme, I'm sure. So anyway, there's just some original thought. Oh, the other thing, one last thing is every system, you know, one of the things about we move from these old fertility cult systems into these patriarchal you know, military systems of empire and, you know, the virtues of one age become the taboos of the next age you know so what was you know standard operating procedure in one time period becomes ver ver you know, forbidden you know that is the sin of the next age so anyway so back to you okay <clears throat> thanks for that one uh, blackbird yep some good thoughts there um, just in case people haven't heard of Stanley Kubrick, um, he's, he's very well known in, um, or he was, uh, very well known in the Hollywood circles, uh, uh, very experienced director. I'll just give you a list from, say, 1960 up to his last film anyway. Uh, Spartacus was his, was he did in 1960, in 1962, I wasn't, didn't know about this, but he was involved in Lolita, a very controversial book at the time. People need to want to look into that one. And of course, we heard about the famous Lolita Express and Jeffrey Epstein and all that. 1964, Dr. Strangelove. 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey. 1971, A Clockwork Orange. 1975, Barry Lyndon. 1980, The Shining. 1987, Full Metal Jacket. And then 1999, Eyes Wide Shut. So um, anyway, the story kind of kicks off with um, so Tom Cruise, uh, <coughs> who plays uh, Bill Harford, and his wife, Nicole Kidman, as Alice Harford. He's a very successful doctor in New York, and um, they seem to be kind of happy. They live in a beautiful plush apartment off Central Park somewhere, you know, they're where all the, the rich people live in New York. They all live around there, these big, flashy apartments. and. Life is very good, you know, he seems to know a lot of very influential people and he himself and his wife get in, uh, invited to a Christmas party um, by <clears throat> Victor Z Ziegler, who is obviously a well-known uh, businessman in New York, played by Sidney Pollack, and um, a very, very plush party. 
and they don't really know anyone, but they're invited because this Victor Ziegler guy obviously knows Bill Harford, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so they're there anyway, and they're having a few drinks, and uh, you know, do we know anybody here? Not really. And then uh, Bill Harford looks around and he sees the guy playing the piano, and he goes, oh, "I know that guy." Um, that's Nick Nightingale. That's a guy I went to med school with. And then, and then <clears throat> Alice says, well, what's he doing for a doctor? He's, play, he's a pretty good piano player. Well, he said, no, he actually dropped out of med school. All oh, right. So um, the band has a break anyway. So uh, Bill goes over to Nick and, you know, reintroduces himself and, hey, how are you doing? And long time no see and all of that. And um, they're chatting away for a bit, a bit about old times, and then he said uh, that Nick said that he was playing a kind of a gig in a jazz club uh, for the next two weeks. Drop in there, and we'll have a proper drink and a chat, and uh, that was fine. And then uh, <clears throat> um, Bill going goes off. You know, he has a wander around then, and um, he meets up with two models who are coming on to him quite strong and um but nothing kind of happens it's all kind of you know harmless fun really but it's it, there's definitely a come on there you know and it's two of them as well and it was a very interesting thing they said um well where where do you want to go he said well to the end of the rainbow and of course that's very significant as the, the movie goes on you know because we'll see the rainbow you know that there's that rainbow symbolism again. It's you know they always throw that in there, and uh, so while he's being chatted up by the two girls, um, Nicole Kidman is having a drink by herself at the, at the table, and this uh, uh, it's an older man, uh, you know, very suave guy comes up and starts uh, introducing himself to her and. Uh, Asks like what she's doing and that she, well, she's not doing anything at the moment, or she doesn't need to because they're very well off, but that she used to run an art gallery and that, well, he, he used to run one as well and, or he knew people in the art world and he could put him back into in touch with people if, if, if uh, she wanted. And anyway, he said, would your husband mind if, you know, we dance and they danced and, you know, again, there's a lot of come on, there's, again, the sexual overtones here, it's, it's back and forth. And, um, and eventually, that nothing happens. Obviously, they, you know, they go their own way. And um, the next thing is then that Bill is called upstairs. Uh, there's an incident. And um, I suppose, yeah, I, I leave it that before we go on to that inc incident where what happens upstairs in the in uh, Ziegler's room in his bathroom, I think it is. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it there and just say what what you guys make of that first, uh, say, ten minutes of that film. Uh, over to you, Betwixt. Yeah, the that's for Ray that you mentioned. It seems to be a tester for the real thing because no sooner have uh, Bill and Alice, you know, entered the venue than they're separated, and it seems to be intentional. Like as you said, Bill is being escorted away by these two gorgeous. Uh, female models and Alice ends up dancing with this sophisticated artistic, I think he says he's from Hungary, uh, this man and they're dancing very, very, like their faces are <laughs> millimeters apart as they're, as they're dancing and she seems to be indecisive. She doesn't know whether she'll go upstairs with this guy or not and she keeps mentioning her husband and at the same time Bill is being chatted up by these two beautiful young women. So as I say, it seems to be a kind of primer. Um, maybe uh, some of the, the powerful people are seeing, you know, what members of the up and coming society could they recruit into their into their cult. You mentioned the musician, the, the pianist, uh, Nick Nightingale. I just I was just thinking there when you said it, you know, the Nightingale is is mentioned a lot in in 
uh, English poetry for its uh, the, the sound of the nightingale and all that. So I'm sure that name was not uh, accidental. Uh, it's funny as well that, you know, in we'll get into it anyway, that he, he'll mention later how he plays at certain gigs and he has to wear a blindfold. And uh, I think the blindfold is symbolic of of him and everyone else that they really don't know who the big movers and shakers are. They really don't know what, what surrounds them and what controls their lives. And there was something else I wanted to say. Ah, yeah, I am. The two of you mentioned that this this movie is based on a on a novel or whatever. I, I did read that Kubrick he he had this he had the idea for this film in his head from the 1970s on. So it took him 20 odd years to finally start filming it. And when I watched it, when I watched it recently, I was thinking that there is some sort of similarity with James Joyce's The Dead, because in in that novella the main character, uh, Gabriel, he's at, a, he's at a kind of Christmas party at his two elderly aunt's house and his cousin's house. And you've got all these posh guests, you know, the, the posh people from, from the city of Dublin. And several times in that novella, he, he looks at his wife and he admires her and he, he thinks how lucky he is. And then at the very end, he finds out that she's she's really down in the dumps and when he when he kind of pries her she reveals that she's been thinking all night about uh this guy who was probably her first love in in county galway it was snowing at the time and the the, the young fella he had some sort of sickness and he was supposed to stay in bed but he 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 escaped out of his house and he ran across to where she lived and he was throwing stones at the window to try and uh, get her to come to the window and all that and all that night she'd been thinking of him of this guy and the the character gabriel becomes really really jealous of this uh, of this guy because this guy's no longer alive this happened so long ago but there's nothing he can do about it and he feels very very jealous so i think there are some parallels there plus you know the whole christmas theme as well yeah um that's a good parallel, actually. I remember seeing The Dead. That's actually quite a good movie, too. Well worth watching. Um, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, Blackbird, over to you, and then we'll, we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah, there's just so much in the opening scenes. I just, you know, from, <clears throat> you know, just we're going to a Christmas party to suddenly life comes at you fast. And like Betwixt was saying, was this series of events, you know, organic or was it synthetic? Were they being scouted by the super rich that live in both worlds, you know, the visible world, the business world, but also this secret world, the land of Nod, if you will, east of Eden. And... <clears throat> You know, so this idea of, you know, when she's the first shot is Nicole Kidman in the little black dress in front of a window in front of a mirror. Right. And there's curtains, but the curtains are open and there are Venetian blinds and they keep going back to the Venetian blinds and the Venetian masks of this, you know, novel that was originally set, you know, there. Uh, so is this, you know, the debauchery that was, you know, Venice was known for, I think is what Kubrick is trying to portray. And one of the things about the two first characters we meet, you know, the young, do you know, the young, handsome doctor and his trophy art gal wife that had the you know art career but now you know she is his trophy wife raising his beautiful perfect daughter right and you know you don't see the daughter yet the daughter is being left with the babysitter while they go to a christmas party and it's like well what kind of christmas party you do not bring the whole family to right uh, so now you leave the child behind because it's not that kind of christmas party um and the idea of the uh, musician 
at the party was the guy from college that they used to get in trouble to, you know, get in trouble with. And, you know, that he's a magic, you know, the musician and happens to also be in both worlds, but he's not part of both worlds. He is just a Shabbat Goy musician. And it's interesting when you go back to Genesis and, you know, the story of you know, the, the other thing about this movie is it's about sex and murder, you know, crimes of passion, crimes of, you know, the shadow hand. And, of course, the first murder was Cain and Abel, right? And the bloodlines of Cain. And we look and, you know, Cain has Lamech and, you know, Cain has the mark to distinguish him so that nobody will mess with him. Right. And then Lamech. Uh, had the two wives, so you know this is like the Zabati and the Frankens, Frank, uh, the Frankus that you know are big into wife swapping, big into multiple wives, etc. Uh, so Ada and Zilla, hear my voice, Lamech's wives, listen to what I say. I killed a man for wounding me, a boy for striking me. Sevenfold vengeance is taken for Cain, but seventy-sevenfold for Lamech. And then when you look at the children of Lamech, uh, you know, it says that Lamech married two women. The name of the first was Ada and the name of the second was Zilla. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the ancestor of the tent dwellers and the owners of livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the ancestors of all who play the lyre and the flute. As for Zilla, she gave birth to Tubal Cain. He was the ancestor of all medical workers, uh, metal workers and art, you know, artists, right, that built in metal and bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. And so here you not only have the traveling circus beginning, the carnival, the tricksters moving in, but you have the musicians that are, you know, this is the beginning of the musicians that, you know, are going to play wherever their boss tells them to play. The huntsman who's going to kill whoever, whatever the boss says kill. And then the uh, prostitute who's going to have sex with whoever the boss tells her to have sex with or to set up. And that's the other thing is all the sexual entrapment we see throughout this. Uh, so that is uh, Namal. And it's interesting that Genesis doesn't go into detail about her, but in Jewish mysticism especially, they go into you know how much of a demoness Namal was like uh uh, Lilith, you know, and so this idea of this Esther type demon evil queen type image, the, the seductress, the temptress that's going to lead you to your doom, you know. So these are some of the archetypes I think that uh, Kubrick is trying to work in there at the beginning because it's all, you know, we see more and more Masonic influence. And that story of Cain and Abel <laughs> is, you know, that is huge in Masonic symbols. Uh, that, you know, so, yeah, this is the basis, I think, you know, Kubrick is trying to explain, you know, the esoteric side of Freemason symbolism. And we see, you know, more and more of this as the film progresses, as you get into that, you know, land of Nod, east of Eden, the hidden world. So back to you. Yeah, very interesting points, sir. Yeah, you did a little bit of research on this, huh? That's, uh, that's uh, pretty good. I like that one. Um, yeah, that's uh, again. That's what I thought as well. When I watched this movie first, I wasn't. I didn't pick up on the fact that Bill Harford was being could have been. This has been set up for him. You know, uh, this was a test to see how far he would go. And it's it is quite obvious. I think that from the get go, as soon as he goes into that party, that uh, and how things just develop, uh, that he's been tested. Uh, the actors are in place, so to speak, to guide him along, and 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 also his wife, and uh, just to see how they'll react to certain situations, and um, you know, see if he wants to become part of the the gang, so to speak. And as you said, he's got trying to revolve between the normie world and this shadow world, where people, uh, you know, we don't know who's got, what's who, who these people are and what they do behind the scenes. So obviously, this is Ziegler guy. He's a mover and shaker in New York City. That the party's on this 
big house that he's got in the city. You know, waiters and butlers everywhere, you know, the, the drink is flowing, the food is there, the music and, you know, it's uh, it's a very uh, upmarket kind of um, party, this one, you know. And um, so anyway, uh, one of the uh, butlers, whoever comes up to Bill Harford says that uh, Victor wants to see him upstairs, if you wouldn't mind, so. So sure, yeah. So the, he, goes, he goes upstairs anyway, and um, uh, Victor is just in his in his trousers basically. And um, okay, that's a bit of a shock. And there's this naked woman uh, lying on the couch, and he Ziegler just says, "I don't know what happened. She just took a kind of a fit or something and just collapsed and." She was obviously on drugs and she took some heroin or whatever, a mix of heroin and something else and completely conked out. So Bill has a look at her, tries to get her sorted, tries to bring her back a bit and um, eventually they kind of, they get her out of the coma or whatever that she was in and she was okay and said, okay, you need to get sorted out. Now, this is a, uh, her name is Mandy Curran played by Julianne Davis, that's the actress's name. And uh, <clears throat> she, um, you know, Bill said, you know, you're going to have to go into rehab and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, so they, they sort that out. Uh, obviously a very awkward moment for Bill. He's kind of going, what the hell's going on here? Why, what does uh, Victor's wife know what's happening here? Like, what's, what was he doing in the bathroom with this naked woman? This is, this is odd, but he, you know, he just says nothing, doesn't think anything of it so much, but he's obviously, he is thinking about it, but, you know, he's being professional as a doctor, you know, uh, sorts out the patient. And then uh, Victor says to him, you know, Bill, you know, this is between us, you know, you know what happened here? And he goes, sure, of course, of course, Victor, no problem at all. It's between us, no, no big deal here. So, um, they, they go back down again, uh, they go back down to the party and um, uh, whew, I'm sure, where, what, where does it go from there? Okay, betwixt, do you want to go from there? What what happens next? I mean, I mean what, what's your take on that scene in that in bathroom? Because that, that was kind of strange, wasn't it? It was like at that moment there, we knew that, uh, you know, the, yeah, that Bill has been kind of set up here, you know? Uh, he hardly knows Victory. He only sees him once or twice a year, maybe, and he's invited to this very fancy party. And yet, he's been asked to come up to a bathroom where he's there with this naked woman in, in uh, uh, lying on the couch. You know, obviously he was having sex with her, and she uh, out of her head on drugs and she collapsed or something and he, he obviously tries to sort out the situation but he's very professional about it and says nothing okay doctor patient confidentiality so to speak but um it, that was an interesting moment what yeah over to you betwixt what's your take on that bit it was quite funny in a way because you know the the butler summoned um harford and you know it would have taken him probably a few minutes to get up there because it's, it's a massive mansion of a place and you think that victor would have <laughs> you know you you think he would have had his trousers up and, and his belt buckled and all but uh, he was still more or less uh you know getting getting dressed when you know when the doctor entered so yeah it was um strange but also it would have given uh ziegler the idea that you know the a good doctor can be trusted to keep a secret and there's something I, I meant to mention a few minutes ago and that is when when Alice is dancing with that uh, tall Hungarian guy his name is Zaro and he says to her you know why women used to get married don't you and she says why don't you tell me and he says it was the only way they could lose their virginities and be free to do what they wanted with other men the ones they really wanted. So <laughs> when I saw this, I was thinking, I was thinking, you know, there are people out there who have that idea. They despise the idea of marriage, 
of monogamy, whatever, they absolutely despise it, the institution of marriage. And a guy like this, Zaro, he just sees marriage as, you know, what I presume, I presume he sees marriage as just a stepping stone for a woman to, you know, have sex with hundreds and hundreds of men. So, yeah, I'll pass it back. Okay, um, Blackbird, yeah, your thoughts on that, Sam? Oh, great points. And again, you know, one of the things about sex magic, it reduces to two very simple formulae. And <clears throat> to not be crass, but it basically is that stimulus of you either find the other person attractive or you don't. And at the physiological level, the man says, you make me hard. You know, you physically make me erect. And then the woman is, you make me wet. I have a physical reaction to your physical presence of sexual arousal. And this is that magic of if it's not there, there's no potion in the world that is going to make it be there, right? And the you know, alchemists and chemists have tried for thousands and thousands of years to bypass this little rule of sexual magic. And then, you know, in these old fertility cult systems, after you know, around 10,000 to 4,000 BC, you know, it was all about the beautiful people rule and get the best of everything and everyone else is, you know, lower caste system. This was a, you know, a caste system. Yeah, you, know, you had alphas, betas, gammas, deltas, you know, uh, epsilons and zetas and the zetas were called and it was all, you know, think about the evil queen that sought perfection. I am the fairest of all. And it was all about the hottest guy on the May Day Festival got to have sex with all the maidens, right? That was the whole May Day ritual of whoever survived the bloodbath of May Day to be the champion in these fertility cult systems, you know, would be the sire of an entire generation. And those babies were graded and, you know, sorted and culled for perfection. This was the whole symbolism of it. And so you had, you know, the sacred prostitutes of the temple. Uh, and, you know, there was no such thing as bastard children in the system because, you know, you were, you know, everything was a gift of the goddess, right? And, you know, so the Nicole Kidman and, you know, Tom Cruise are the beautiful people. They are the people that, you know, I want to have sex with you at this level, you know, and they know they have that power. This is the thing that, you know, Tom Cruise throughout this movie says, I'm a doctor, trust me, but he never tells the truth or does anything honorably and through the whole movie, but yet he's got that charismatic charm and she's the same way. She's that charismatic, I use my sex appeal as power, I, you know, and so they are this, you know, beautiful people, you know, on their ascendant of their you know, success but then they run into the real rich. And that is a completely different ballgame. And I always go back to the F. Scott Fitzgerald quote from The Great Gatsby. Let me tell you about the very rich. They are different from you and me. They possess and enjoy early and it does something to them. Makes them soft where we are hard and cynical where we are trustful. In a, and in a way, unless you were born rich, it's very difficult to understand. They think deep in their hearts that they are better than we are because we had to discover the compensations and the refugees of our lives for ourselves. Even when they enter deep into our world, leave that again, even when they enter deep into our world or sink below us, they still think that they are better than we are. They are different. And so this is the thing with the Ziegler guy that he is just the uber rich, powerful 
of this, you know, the elite, the 1%. This is the mega group type people. This is the Jeffrey Epstein's. This is, you know, that uber elite group that moves in all the right circles, right? Um, so, you know, and then, you know, the prostitute, you know, we're told that, you know, this guy is, you know, banging a prostitute at his Christmas party, you know, behind his wife's back, apparently, you know, the brazen doing it in his own bedroom and she's overdoing, overdosing on drugs and he comes in to help, right? And to keep silent. And that is the big thing, you know, a test to see if you can keep a sensational secret to yourself. And that is the big thing in Freemasonry of, you know, can you keep your mouth shut? And what do you call a first person in the military, a private. Can you keep something private? Can you keep your mouth shut? If you can't keep your mouth shut about military operations, you don't move up in rank. The people that move up in rank are the ones that can keep their mouth shut and lie convincingly, right? So, you know, this is, you know, uh, and also you have this idea of people that just, you know, this Zabatian Frankist crowd of the counterculture absolutely hates the family unit. They absolutely hate high trust Christian communities about telling the truth because their power lies in deception. And, you know, uh, I used to, you know, this film really hit because my wife was in that art scene world. You know, she was quote unquote international artist, right? And, you know, you would be in these type of situations, these scenes where, you know, people would, you know, try to seduce someone just to see if they could and if they could break up happy couples and they would brag about this. You know, this is the mindset of these people in these globo homo anti, you know, European culture, you know, counterculture type artists, right, that they just, you know, spit at the idea of Christmas, the idea of family, the idea of Christianity. They hate it with every fiber of their being, and they love to corrupt people in that system. You know, think of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> you know, what is that all about? Is corruption of youth, right? Did I get a Rocky Horror Picture Show? Of course I did, right? Um, but, yeah, this is that whole thing of, you know, this, the uber rich, you know, they are a different type of people. And then, you know, you bring in the biological aspect of, you know, the goyim going to the elite Jewish party, and it brings on another dynamic of a racial dynamic. So, anyway, back to you. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Blackboard. You have very interesting points you make there. And you know, you would think if uh, <clears throat> if Bill he was if he was an upright, uh, you know, doctor, uh, upstanding citizen, whatever, he would have pulled Ziegler aside and said, "What the hell are you doing there? You know, you know, your wife's in the other room or down at the party, and you're here bonking this wo this woman on the couch, and she's out of her head on drugs. I mean, what are you doing?" He didn't even ask that question. He just went along to go along, and of course, he was asked to kind of stay stumb, and he does. So, um, yeah, the, the next scene then is, I think they go home from the party and then the next night, um, Alice pulls out a big bag of weed that she keeps in the, in the bathroom closet and um, the two of them are smoking a joint uh, in bed and they're talking about stuff, they're getting stoned and um, they're talking about their uh, fantasies, I suppose, unfulfilled kind of temptations. And... Uh, you know, neither of them are really jealous of 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 each other. You know, they they seem quite faithful, and they're you know, they know as you said, Blackbird, that uh, Bill is a successful doctor, and he's got his trophy wife. But they're they're faithful, and she she's not going to run off with other men, though he knows that other men would be, you know, looking at her, ogling at her, and all the rest. And I think he kind of likes that anyway. And I think she thinks the same of him, you know, because obviously a lot of women would be attracted to him because he's a good looking guy. He's, he's a, a successful doctor making lots of money. So um, 
So they're both aware of that situation. But then Alice, Alice admits then to uh, fantasizing about a, a, a guy she met uh, while on uh, vacation somewhere in a, in a hotel. And uh, I think he, uh, he was a, a naval officer, I think. Yeah. And um, there was kind of a, a, an immediate attraction right there and um, between the two of them. Like nothing happened, but she fantasized about the whole thing and um, considered leaving uh, Bill and his daughter uh, and their daughter. So, and uh, Bill then was obviously thinking, well, I'm wondering, did this actually happen? Uh, maybe it did, you know, and now can he trust her? Uh, what's going on here? So you can just see he's very disturbed by the whole thing. But anyway, at that point, the, the phone rings and um, someone obviously, yeah, somebody has died again that Bill obviously knows and um, could he come around? And so he kind of shakes out of it a bit. And he says, yeah, I'll, I'll be around in half an hour. And um, and he leaves. Uh, but you can see while he's getting the taxi over to this uh, house that he's thinking a lot about what Alice had just said to him. And because that he that kind of shook him because um, he was thinking that she would be 100% faithful to him, but maybe that's not the case anymore. And maybe that he, something did happen between her and this uh, naval guy. So anyway, when um, he gets to the house, uh, again, he, he knows the family, an old man, uh, he, he's died again, very rich by the looks of a nice big house. And the daughter, whose name is Marion, uh, she's obviously very upset and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, she's emotional and says, that, oh, she's going to get married to her fiance who's flying over back from London or something. And, you know, and, and uh, Bill's always very happy about that, and that's great. And then she literally goes for him. So, so we've got more seduction again, right? So it, this is a recurring theme throughout this seduction, you know? And he obviously, he resists this, you know, and then he's thinking, oh my God, I'm just after thinking about Alice and what she could have done. And now this woman's coming on to me and, oh, you know, he's, a lot, you know, he, you can see he's really troubled by all of this. <clears throat> and um, so he he leaves that house eventually. And he goes for a walk to think about things. And while he's walking along, a, a woman uh, comes up to him who's obviously a prostitute. Her name is Domino. You find out her name is Domino. And um, asks him back to her place. You know, she, uh, she just lives down the street here. And again, he's hesitant about it, but then, you know, he was thinking, well, maybe Alice did have uh, something going on with this naval officer. So maybe, maybe I should try something here. So he's getting seduced again. So uh, he goes in anyway, and um, but nothing happens. Um, the prostitute actually, is, she's quite pleasant, you know, she's not what you'd normally think as a prostitute. She seems to be quite, quite you know, educated and uh, well spoken on that and you know and very pleasant but you know she was willing to to do the business with him and they discussed money and everything and they agreed on 150 dollars i think it was and all good and then he gets the phone call from alice wondering where he is and he says well i'll be a little bit longer i'm not sure how long it'll be but i'll be home at some point and he says, OK, and and then uh, Domino says, OK, is that uh, is that Mrs. Bill? And she said, yeah. And he says, oh, so you probably have to go home now. Uh, yeah, I think so. And um, so anyway, he pays her anyway. And, you know, even though she doesn't want it, she insists that you have it. And so he he leaves. So we go on from that one, uh, that scene there, uh, guys. Um, as you, you can see where this is all going, like there's just one thing after another after another. So that's just that scene there from when they, you know, Bill, Alice and Bill are getting stoned on the bed to 
a few hours later, he's in a in a in a in a room with a prostitute. It's 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 wow, oh, it's incredible how that happened. Okay, over to you, Betwixt. That scene, yeah, that scene where they're where they're smoking the grass or whatever. It's it's a very long scene, and there's a lot of dialogue there, and some of it is very very good. It's very well written. But the idea that Alice would admit to throwing away everything just for one night of of love, of passion, of sex, whatever. It just doesn't register in Bill's brain. He's completely shocked because he he thinks he thinks he has, you know, the female, the the, the female species, the fairer sex. He he thinks all they want is, you know, a bit of style, security, and then they're happy out. But he doesn't take into account, you know, hypergamy. And when you go beyond that, you know, in this case, the female will, will take a risk that could destroy the family, destroy everything. Um, you know, you get into divorce courts, you get into a child being pulled between two parents. That's... Alice would risk all that, you know, traumatizing her child for years to come just for one night with this guy she doesn't know. That scene where Bill uh, goes to, I think it's like a wake for one of his elderly patients and the daughter of the patient is there, Marion. She's like a spider in a web. <laughs> it's, it's, it seems as though she has phoned him before she phoned her own fiance to come because he comes a little while afterwards. And it's a setup really. Uh, her sexual desire takes precedence over mourning for her own father. And that's very difficult for one to wrap one's head around that uh, this woman, she's uh, middle-aged, I guess, or pushing middle age. Her idea is that she can seduce the good doctor uh, in front of the corpse of her father. And in that scene, you know, she mentions her, her fiance. She says, we're going to get married soon. And Bill says, well, you know what, Marion? I think that is great. And she's taken aback because she thought in her imagination that Bill would say, no, no, uh, don't marry him. Uh, marry me. I'll divorce my wife. So she's taken aback and then she says, yeah, you know, he's he's uh, he might be moving to some part of America for his teaching job. And she then says he's he's a maths professor. And again, Bill says, well, that's just wonderful. <laughs> it's like no matter what she says, he's throwing it back at her, you know. And then when that doesn't work, she pretends that she's, uh, you know, she's really upset about her father dying. So she pulls that little card out and starts uh, acting as though she's having a breakdown. And it looks like she's going to hug him, but as as he goes to to put his arms around her, she uh, she kisses him. And then uh, not long after, he, I think, yeah, Bill says something to her like, uh, you know, he says, we hardly know each other. <laughs> he says, we hardly know each other. So they've probably only met once or twice, you know, before. And he says, we've, you know, we've, we hardly know each other. And she's like, I've always loved you. I've always loved you. And then the, whatever, the, the doorbell rings or the intercom, you know, they're very wealthy. This family, they have a maid in uniform and everything. And the fiance then, we see him in the corridor entering the room. And before he enters, Marion says to Bill, uh, please don't think badly of me. And, um, it's a very, I have to say, it's a very, very good scene. And the woman who played Marion, Marie Richardson, I think she put in a very good performance there. The the facial uh, facial expressions, body language, you, you can feel the tension. The prostitute, yeah, that's an interesting scene as well, because then, you know, Bill is kind of on the warpath. He, he, keeps, he keeps having these, um, they're like dreamlike states. He goes into a dreamlike state where he's, it's like he's a fly on the wall and it's like in black and white and he's looking at his wife with this uh, this guy, this um, naval officer or whatever, and they're having sex. And 
uh, it's really really annoying him. So he he's out for vengeance. He wants to be promiscuous on this night, and he's walking along the street, and a prostitute starts following him, and then. Uh, lo and behold, they end up when they stop walking. They're right outside the door of her apartment building. They go in and nothing really happens. They, I think they kiss, they talk. Um, he, possibly he was going to have sex, but then his, his wife phoned to see what was taking him so long. And he pretended that he was still with uh, Marion and, you know, the wake of her father. He pretended he was still there. And then he goes to pay the prostitute. And I thought this was interesting. She then says, no, no, you know what? You don't have to pay me. Um, and he says, no, 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 I insist. And she's like, no, no, no. And I thought that was interesting because if he gives her the money, he's treating her as a prostitute. Uh, if she receives the money, you know, it's in her head that is getting across the idea that, yes, she is a prostitute. And there can be no ro romance here. It's a business transaction. So she's she's very insistent that she doesn't receive the money but he insists that she does get it and that kind of I would say kind of severs the ties obviously she's happy it's $150 for a, a little French kiss and, and a bit of chit chat but she really didn't want the money uh, not not with this guy and I leave it there yeah that's that's, that's a good points there and again, you brought up a good one too, like uh, Marion coming on to um, to Bill while the father is dead in the bed. It's like, forget about him. You know, this is about us and, and declaring his, her undying love for him. And I'm sure Bill is thinking that this happened between Alice and this naval guy as well, you know. So as you said, and he was have, have, having all these thoughts while he was in the taxi cab of Alice having sex with this naval officer. And he's like, you know, he... He's thinking, I'm going to go out now and I'm going to get my own back, so to speak. And But he, he doesn't actually do it. Now, would he have had sex with with Domino if the phone call didn't come through? Well, maybe, yeah, prop, quite possibly, but he didn't. I mean, he still had time because she did, he didn't give a time to say he'd be back to Alice again. He said, oh, I'd be here, could be here for a little while longer. So they could have had a, a quickie, so to speak, and off he went. But it's a good point you made that he did pay her, and that was a business transaction, and that's what prostitution is all about. You know, if you know, you don't have to have sex if it's just you want to have a, a chat. That's fine. You know, if you want kinky games, whatever, fine. That's whatever you want. That's that's what they're there for. And um, but uh, yeah, over to you, Blackbird. What were your thoughts on that one? I, I thought there were pretty, two pretty good scenes there. Oh, definitely. So much packed into these scenes. And one of the things that this scene brings out is why Kubrick in that opening scene with Nicole Kidman in her little black dress dropping it, you see the floor lamp and behind the floor lamp are two tennis rackets, you know, his and hers tennis rackets. So, you know, in this scene where uh, you see that they are part of this modern couple that are competitive against each other, that they've been taught that, you know, feminism, you have to compete with your mate instead of cooperate. And so you see this uh, scene where, you know, they're going for the hidden stash of this just reiterates that this is a family with secrets they're keeping things from each other and this is a secret that mom and dad have that helena the daughter can't know about yeah because drugs are bad but mom and dad do drugs but we know better because we're part of the beautiful people we can do drugs and so this idea of, you know, they're sitting there at Christmas, it's a week before Christmas, you know, just had this bizarre party, you know, experience, just wanting to relax as they figure out the next phase of the Christmas plan. And she takes this bizarre left turn about the roles of men and women in society and that men don't have a clue and you know and his image of her as you know well you're my saint 
uh, but in private, you can be my own personal whore, but only for me, you know, uh, but everywhere else, you know, I expect you to be the mother of my you know, child and, you know, the part of the community and, you know, promote me in my professional career, et cetera, you know, the dutiful wife. But, you know, behind closed doors, we can be as debauched as we want, but only with me. I can, I, it's only me. And when she confesses that she has been, you know, attracted to other men uh, and, you know, was willing to make this complete sacrifice, I would throw it all away for one night with that guy, you know, that kind of thing. And, this brings in that dynamic of, you know, the realities of relationships. Once you have crossed the line, there's no going back. You know, everything's going to be different. One of the best, you know, visualizations of this is to tell somebody, you know, pick up a white china plate, right? And then look at it and it's all perfect. Now throw it on the ground and watch it break into a million pieces. Now say, I'm sorry, and see if anything changes. And it's no, you still have a broken plate with a million pieces. And at that low level biological, you know, programming, the betrayal of that marriage bond is one of those things that, you know, you just can't get, a lot of people just never get past it, right? And so this idea of him looping yeah, that's the term where you can't get that emotionally charged thing out of your head and it just loops and loops and it keeps getting worse and worse. And he's trying to get this out of his head. And at the same time, you know, well, you know, she telling me the truth about this. Should I go for revenge sex? Right. So this is the idea of I'm going to have sex with someone else to hurt you because you hurt me. Right. And so you know, this idea of, you know, OK, she has just had his world you know, turned upside down about who he thought his wife was. And then the phone rings. And one of the things I notice in this film is every time there is a shift in the storyline, you hear either a siren from a police car and an ambulance a phone ringing, a bell going off somewhere, but it's just these little audio clips of saying life comes at you fast and everything just shifted. And you know, the phone call, you know, and he has to go out because a patient just died. And this is where he meets this woman who is the guy on the bed's daughter, right? So this is this complete Freudian scene of the father and the daughter. The mother's nowhere to be found you know, in the scene, and she has the safety boyfriend that, you know, okay, I've, I've got this lined up, you know, that dad approved of him, but, you know, she comes clean in the, you know, the emotion of the event that she is in love with the doctor. And this is, you know, what I was saying, you know, a few minutes ago about, you either are attracted to somebody or you're not. And so this idea that, you know, has she been in this secret world of fantasizing about this doctor that they were going to have their happy lair ever after, uh, you know, but once dad is dead, then she will be free to do it rather than marrying the guy dad wanted her to marry, right? And, you know, that she's just completely shocked that, you know, he isn't jealous of her plans and he doesn't desire her and is rejecting her, but you know, graciously trying to, but that is something, you know, what is that? The, uh, uh, I'm flattered, but it's like the worst thing you ever want to hear when you express that you have desire for someone, you know, is that, oh, well, I'm totally flattered, but, you know, I definitely don't feel that way about you. And, um, Oh, the other thing I want to say about the the drugs in the medicine cabinet in the band aid case is, you know, this film is about passions, and so when you look at that hierarchy of needs to wants to desires to passions to obsessions to addictions, 
that, you know, you would throw everything away to get your heart's desire, what you think is your heart's desire. And the rich people that think they can have anything they want, they're money burners, anything my heart desires, I can get. I'm the kind of person that doesn't take no for an answer. You know, this is that intransigent mindset of the uber rich is, you know, no, is you know, underlings don't tell me no. I say it and it happens. You know, that's the mindset. And so, you know, this doctor uh, is now, you know, being doubled whammied of, you know, his wife crashing his world with this, you know, re revealing of her passions. And then this woman that, you know, professing his, her love for him and, you know, it, it just not there for him. And then you see him taking a walk in the red light district, right? So suddenly he's moving from the posh world to the red light district and you see him become a mark for a prostitute. And it's like, okay, Christmas, you know, people come to, you know, red light districts during the holidays for a reason. And so she, you know, zones in on him, starts stalking him playfully, right? And, you know, they end up going to her apartment and you see that she is a student at probably a community college or something, you know, is majoring in sociology and in her <clears throat> nasty apartment, you see not only dirty dishes and left out food, but a Christmas tree, but her Christmas tree doesn't have a star on it or an angel. And this is another thing I noticed in, uh, you know, these scenes that have Christmas trees, you know, why doesn't that one have an angel or a star? And this idea of these, you know, angels that fall off the tree, you know, that the angels that have fallen and fallen out of grace. And so this idea of Christmas, you got a tree with no star, no angel on it in a prostitute's apartment. There are Christmas presents there. There are college textbooks. And on the wall are all these Venetian masks. Yeah, so she's obviously very interested in this idea of the mass culture of the hidden people, especially in the you know, Venice and you know that that period from the 1600s to the 1900s, yeah, that uh, just a lot going on in Venice, right? These secret societies, and uh, you know we see him, you know, obviously an amateur at you know picking up prostitutes, so she sees he's a newbie. And then the phone rings and it's the wife. You know, here's reality calling. You have a wife and daughter here that's calling to check on you. And he tells her a lie, you know, the convenient lie that's, you know, setting the story of uh, this is total plausibility. You know, this will get me out. I'm not in a, in a prostitute's apartment negotiating a price for sex to get revenge on you for what you told me over after dinner. You know, I'm still you know, here dealing with this dead patient, right? So this total lying to the spouse, you know, to just keep everything going along, uh, you know, is just, you know, a fascinating part of this. And then he, of course, decides not to, you know, have sex with her after all. But there's that, you know, feeling that she sincerely was attracted to him and that he, you know, sincerely was attracted to her and that, you know, in another time, you know, what could have happened type of thing, right? So I just find that uh, fascinating that, you know, um, this prostitute, you know, is, even though she's a prostitute, she still has got, you know, people on her Christmas list. She's got Christmas cards. She's got Christmas presents uh, and a Christmas tree. Uh, this is how she's probably putting her way through school is by hooking. And I think of all the young women now, especially all the young European Christian women, that you know, have walked away from that and are now doing OnlyFans, et cetera, to put themselves through school. Girls that start doing porn to pay for their education so they don't have to take out student loans, right? This is the rationale. And then to say, I, you know, you know, am a fine product of feminism. I did this on my own. And uh, you know, so that's just how warped the system is of trying to, you know, um, normalize sex work 
in European countries. They, oh, no, this isn't prostitution. This is an organized crime. This is, you know, just sex work. There's nothing wrong about this. This is how people survive now. So those are just some of the observations I had on that. So back to you. Yeah, thanks for that, Blackbird. Yeah, good points there. Actually, going back to the star, I just want to ask you this one, Blackbird. Um, remember going back to the Christmas party, and there was this decoration on the wall, which kind of stood out a lot, and I was looking at it. It looked like two pentagrams, uh, proper, you know, one the, the, the way it should be, and then an upside-down pentagram interposed on it. Did you get that? Did you pick up on that? Yes, there were several star shapes, and I want to yeah. be able to go back through it to you know really focus on that pattern of yeah. you know they're using the stars and the pentagrams and the hexagrams yeah. and yeah. Uh, also enneagram patterns. Uh, you know, um, and yeah. uh, at one part, you know, when we get to the scene at the uh, hidden party, you yeah. know, they use the eleven, the circle of eleven. Yeah, uh, there are eleven yeah. pre, uh, you know, high priestesses there in their robes. So we'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, yeah definitely yeah, the lot, star imagery. Lots of symbolism in this as well. Oh, it's interesting yeah. when uh, the wife is calling from the kitchen table, the family kitchen table, drinking milk and smoking a cigarette. And, and one of the you know Kubrick always uses that glass of milk, you know, as a way to say. Yeah, here's something wholesome, and I'm going to put it in a completely different context. It's like in uh, Clockwork Orange, you know, the milk was what they would use the uh, take the adrenochrome drugs at, in, right? Uh, at the milk bar, and so here she's at the kitchen table, you know, smoking a cigarette, knowing something's wrong, you know, that she just confessed this really big thing, and he's not coming home. And so she's drinking a glass of milk and smoking a cigarette, right? Yeah. So back That's to it. you. Okay, so we move on from then anyway. So um, uh, Bill leaves uh, Domino's place and goes walking about. And he comes across the jazz club that Nick Nightingale plays in. And he sees the... Uh, the, uh, the kind of, the, you know, the ad, you know, the poster up on the, on the window outside that they're playing that it's on, you know. And he says, oh, yeah, Nick, yeah, he's playing here. So I'll go in now and say hello to him, you know. So they go in anyway. And uh, again, you know, this, you know, there's a guy there. Oh, good evening, sir. There's always a butler again. Uh, as you brought up Blackbird there about there's always uh, an interruption, like a phone call or some kind of, uh, sir, uh, can I take your coat? Can I bring you here? Uh, Mr. So-and-so wants to talk to you over here. You know, they're just being pulled along into this, uh, into this, very deep, dark plot, you know, and it looks again like, as I said, as, as we we all brought up here, that this is all being set up. Uh, Bill has been set up to see how far he'll go here, and Nick is probably in on it, but not. He doesn't know the full plan. But anyway, Nick is playing up on a stage, and uh, the, the the set is just coming to an end, and the song, you know finishes and he introduces, you know, the band and all the rest of it. And um, uh, so Bill is sitting there having a beer and he calls Nick and says, ah, oh, yeah, Nick, yeah, great. And, you know, talk, you know, let's, let's have a good old chat, pack, catch up on old times. And um, but again, they're only talking for about five minutes, you know, not much longer than they did at the party, which is, you know, the whole idea was to meet him at the jazz club where they could have a few beers and chat about old times. But so anyway, Nick, you know, uh, Bill asked him, like, what, what's he do? You know, he, you know, where is he living now? And he's living in Seattle. And this is New York. I mean, that's a long way away, you know. What, what are you doing? Boy, that's a long way to go make a living. He says, well, I just go over to work. Is. He says, but I don't you just do this. I mean, that band, they're just a, just an ordinary bunch of, bunch of guys who play with, you know. And so, you know, obviously, he, you don't fly from Seattle to New York to play in a jazz band in a CD in a jazz club, you know, that, that, that doesn't make sense. But so then Nick describes um, that he, go, he goes to these parties and um, out in the country and uh, it's, it's quite amazing. This is where the big money is. OK. Now, he doesn't know who these people are and um, all he says is, like, I just go to play the piano. The funny thing is, I'm blindfolded, and so I, I don't uh, see what's going on. But he said the odd time the blindfold slips, 
and um, he he has he sees what's going on, and he just whoa wow. But again, he he keeps Storm too. He doesn't want to. Uh, this is a good earner, so he he doesn't want to ruin his chances here. So he, you know. So he tells Bill a bit about it, and uh, he says, well, you want to see the women, the women at this, you know, and all of a sudden Bill is going, oh, wow, women, yeah. This is uh, amazing. So, and it's basically, he's describing like an orgy in a big mansion outside New York City somewhere. And um, and at that moment, a phone call comes through to Nick, and it's, uh, he gets instructions where to go, all the rest of it, and he's trying to write it on a napkin, and you'd be thinking he's trying to write the address but he writes a password which is fidelio which is an interesting word i think um considering what the theme of this movie is fidelio and um and he said well that's the password and uh bill says i, I want to go with you and says nick and nick says no no you can't i mean you can't go dressed like that and he says well, why not he says no you have to you have to be dressed in a costume and a mask and where are you going to get that now at two o'clock in the morning? And uh, so he goes, yeah, right. Um, but he really wants to go. Bill really wants to go to this. So anyway, he's got the password and um, he obviously knows a guy in town who owns a costume store called Rainbow. And this is this is interesting. This is this whole scene kind of quite disturbing, actually. And I think this is where Kubrick, I think, pushed the envelope quite a bit here. Um, so he rings this doorbell outside this rainbow store, okay, a costume, rent a costume kind of store. And this guy answers, you know, foreign sounding, uh, could very well have been Jewish. But I looked up the actor, he's actually Croatian, but. Um, you know, he he looked he looked like a Jew, put it that way, and he sounded like it, you know. And um, he said, "Oh, is Doctor So and So uh, live here? I'm a good friend of his." Um, he said, "No, no, he moved to Chicago. He doesn't. Oh, no, no, sorry, not his doctor. Is is the man who who lived here? Is he does he is he here anymore?" He says, "No, no, he he moved to Chicago. I I, I own this shop now." He says, "Oh, okay." Um, is there a chance you can come down and talk to me? I need to get in touch with them and whatever. And uh, so they're at they're at the the front door, and the guy doesn't want it. I mean, it's two in the morning, right? And uh, he says, oh, I, I need to get a costume." He says, "I know it's two in the morning, and I'll pay over the odds to get the costume. Uh, I'll pay the rental, and then I'll give you two hundred dollars on top of that. How about that?" He says a hundred dollars at first, and then the guy says, "No, no, no." He says, "Okay, two hundred. He says, "Okay, come in." Brings him in anyway. Shows him around. He says, "What do you need?" I said, "Well, I need a hooded costume and a mask and a tuxedo." He says, "Yeah, I can give you that." And um, anyway, he's looking through the suits and whatever, and then they hear a noise from his office, and he says, "Did you hear that noise?" He says, "Yeah, I heard something." So they go to the to the office anyway. And uh, this guy is called Milich, and he opens the office door and he finds two two Asian guys <laughs> uh, dressed in well, like dressed like women, really, aren't they? Whatever they were, it was again this whole tranny stuff is involved here. So he's bringing all this in, you know. And then lo and behold, who's there as well? But his young daughter, who looks about fourteen. If that, and it was quite disturbing seeing this, you know. And they're saying, "Well, Mr. Millage, we had an arrangement." He said, "Oh, get out, get out! I'll call the cops." Blah blah blah, you know, get out to him. And what are you doing? He's talking to his daughter. You slut! What are you doing? Oh, no, no, this is crazy. And he said, "Sorry about this. I'll call the cops and I'll deal with these people." And, and again, Bill is like, "What the hell is going on here?" But he needs his costume, so he gets his costume, and off he goes. But again, as you know. The shop is called Rainbow, and remember the two models at the party says, we go to wherever the rainbow, where the rainbow ends, right? So this shop is called Rainbow, which is I thought, very interesting there. And um, and of course, we know about the rainbow symbolism. We, we you know, talk about symbolism. There's the rainbow symbolism. 
So, uh, yeah, uh, that was a very disturbing scene, that one. And then there's a follow on scene where he comes back with the costume later on. And uh, there's another very disturbing scene there. But when um, he chases the two Asian guys out of the office and the daughter runs behind Bill and kind of hugs him from behind, pushes himself in there and kind of smiling at him and kind of whispering things into his ear. And Bill is kind of going, whoa, 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 what's happening? Yeah, as I said, is this what the theme of the movie was and why certain scenes were cut out, you know? And we'll talk about that in a while, I'm sure. So we'll just talk about that scene alone there because that to me was, that was quite disturbing, that bit. Over to you, Betwixt. Yeah, you've you've made some excellent points there, Bryzer. Getting back to that uh, jazz club or whatever, and as you said, they just the two guys they just never have a chance to really go back down memory lane in medical school. You know uh, why Nick dropped out and the friends they knew. They just it's just not written that they will they will ever be able to reminisce properly. As you say, there are always these interruptions, and I thought it was uh, well. We'll get into it later, but. The idea that Nick, he has four boys. So, you know, he's a big family back in Seattle that he has to, to look after. And as you've said, it's, you know, these CD bar gigs, uh, that's a bit of pocket money. The, the big money is when he goes to these uh, secret parties in, in mansions. And that makes it worthwhile, him being in New York and not in Seattle. But when that call comes, he has to write down the password and Bill helps him by holding, you know, because uh, Nick had one hand on, you know, holding his, his mobile phone and then he has his, his other hand with the pen and he's not able to write on it until Bill straightens out the edges. So it's kind of like Bill is just, he's, he's in the right place at the right time. He's gone to this party and the only thing stopping him now, he has the password. The only thing stopping him is whether he can get a cloak and a mask uh, at this ungodly hour and that's when he goes to that store and that is a very bizarre scene I, I i speculate here this this is my impression that this millage guy is pimping out his own daughter and uh, there is a i think it's down and out in paris with orwell uh, there's like a russian tramp who is a soldier and he's talking about a Jew is trying to to get him to to sleep with his uh, young teenage daughter, uh, kind of tween or whatever. And he's saying that, you know, she has no diseases. She has, you know, no this. And the Russian soldier says, how do you know? And he says, uh, I tell you, because she's my own daughter, you know. So he's, it seems that he's pimping out his own daughter. And these two Asians, uh, because it's late at night, I think Millich was sleeping when, when Bill arrived. So Millich has no idea that there's a threesome going on in one of the, the rooms of the shop, uh, one of the storerooms or whatever. And he gets very, very angry because he's being cut out of the deal here. You know, these two Asians have made a deal with his daughter and they've cut him out. And he locks them into the room while he's, you know, making <laughs> making his, uh, his money with, with uh, Bill. He locks them into that room and he says, you know, he's going to phone the police. The police will come. They will sort these two guys out. But that's that's a complete bluff. These are customers uh, and uh, he will get money out of them. He will come to an agreement with them in regard to his daughter. Another thing, and uh, Blackbird mentioned this earlier, in, in so many scenes do we see Bill with the with his uh, with his identity card, you know. Hey, look, I'm a doctor. Hey, I'm a doctor. And when he arrives to this um, wig and costume store to try and gain Millage's trust, he he mentions he's 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 a doctor and the, the previous owner was his patient. Millage doesn't give a damn. <laughs> he doesn't give a damn. Uh, the only question he asks uh, Bill is about his hair. He says, "My hair falling out, falling out. My hair. How?" How do I fix? And, and Bill is like, you know, well, uh, Bill just touches his scalp and then says, well, you know, uh, this is in my field. So, yeah, that's that part. And 
yeah, there is something you, you mentioned, Bryzer, and I because I was curious about it. The daughter's name is Lily and the surname is Sobieski. And she whispers into Bill's ear. Now, when people watch this in the cinemas, etc., nobody knew what she whispered. But now, you know, people, they watch it on their laptops or they have it up very loud or they use headphones or earphones. They can hear what she says. And seemingly she said to Bill, you should have a cloak lined with ermine, which is a weasel. And there's some there's some symbolism there with the weasel. It's something about I don't know. Is it like about faithfulness, which would tie into that Fidelio th password, but also the idea of uh, merrymaking. So th so there's that, and I'll pass it back. Yeah. Okay. Blackbird, over to you. Oh, great points. Yeah. Um, this does take a very dark turn. Uh, down this rabbit hole, you know, to where the rainbow ends. That again, you know, this uh, symbolism of the rainbow, where you're going to find your heart's desire. Um, you know, leave home, go go across the rainbow, somewhere over the rainbow is going to be where you want. Leave your home, and a pot of so gold instead of, on the rainbow. Yes, the pot yeah. of gold. You know, whatever you want, you have infinite wealth. You can buy anything you want, buy anyone you want, and so he goes to this club, this jazz club, the Sonata Jazz, and he sees, you know, his friend on the marquee and everything. And the club is empty. You know, there's just a few people there. And the guys, you know, Nick Nightingale is uh, finishing up his set for the evening. So you're looking at, you know, there's no way he's getting paid enough to fly from Seattle, leave his family, you know, at Christmas to come to New York to play to three people in a, you know, a Soho or Greenwich Village, you know, uh, jazz club, right? And so they're sitting there, you know, and they order a couple of drinks. And of course, you know, the thing that gets me is his uh, Van Dyke Trotsky type beard that we always associate with, you know, that Lucifer type beard. You know, this is what the musician has. And he's uh, you know, finishing up the set and he's talking about the after party. And one of the things, if you've ever done music, you know, it's a different world because you're out, you know, your you know, work time is from like 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. So you get off work and, you know, do you go home or you go to the after party you know there's always the after party where everybody goes right and so yeah this yeah i just like get this idea of you know these two fraternity guys trying to live out glory days of oh let's crash this you know posh you know uh christmas party it'll be a blast you know It'll be like old times and it's interesting when the phone rings and He's writing down, you think he's going to write down the address, but instead he writes down the password, which is Fidelia. And yeah, that is the name of the Beethoven uh, Opus 72 from, what is it, 1814? Yeah, 1814. And it's, you know, Lenore or the Triumph of Marital Love, originally triumph, you know, titled Lenore, the Triumph of Marital Love. And so again, this is Kubrick doing everything backwards in that Kabbalistic style. You know, Fr Sabatini and Frankus, you know, Illuminati magic is all about doing the opposite. So you're going to have an orgy. So you make the password Fidelio, right? And, you know, you hate European culture, so you're taking a dig at Beethoven. Uh, and so uh, he's like trying to talk his friend out. of. It's like, no, and you know, I play with a mask. And you know, again, we're in that mask is, you know, the mask and the blindfold. You know, it's like one keeps people from seeing you. The other keeps people from, from keeps you from seeing everybody else, right? So if you got the blindfold on, you can't see. And again, with the Freemason initiations in the Blue Lodge, the initiate is blindfolded for the Inter Apprentice, the Fellow Craft, and the Master Mason degrees. The initiate is completely blindfolded. 
uh, throughout the entire ritual, right? So this idea of there are things going on around you that you don't can't see. And that's the whole message there that, you know, once you are a member, then you're able to see. Uh, and it's always fascinating, terrifying to see, you know, what really happened around you when you were going through those initiations. And again, you know, I did that in the 80s. And so this idea of, you know, that being blindfolded uh, and the idea of, well, you can't go because you, you know, you won't fit in. They'll spot you immediately. You got to have a mask and a cape. Right. Yeah. Hence so the title go, of the, hence the title of the movie. Sorry, Mike, hence the title of the movie Eyes Wide Shut. Yes. Yeah. There you go. You know, the, uh, <laughs> you, know, you can't see or you refuse to see. That's you know the big thing. Uh, so we see him going to the rainbow costume shop, and you know, it's one of those where he used to know the owner, now it's under new management. And as he's walking in the first thing he walks into is a man trap cage that the new owner has put in between the heavily fortified door and the rest of the shop. So you actually had a cage there with a double door type system. And the thing I thought of, I used to do a lot of security work for military and banks. It's amazing the security at things like Bank of America. They used to have these things called man traps on all the doors into certain buildings and your badge would be allowed to, you know, uh, to let you go through certain doors. And I'll never forget one time I was doing training for Bank of America in Charlotte, North Kakalaki, and they did my badge authorization wrong. And I was supposed to be able to come in and out of the man trap door right beside me. There's a security station right by my classroom into the courtyard. And I went out into the courtyard and when I tried to come in, I badged, it gave me the green light. I stepped in and as soon as I step in, it closed and started alarming, you know, and telling me to freeze and just, you know, and comply with authority, et cetera. And all of a sudden there's eight zillion security guards coming at me with guns because they got the alarm that somebody had breached that door and it's because you know, I my badge was set up wrong. And of course, the, I apologized profusely and this, that and the other, you know, and uh, so they take care of it immediately. But, you know, that was just one of the most helpless feelings that you realize you have been deceived and you fell for it. You got the clear go ahead and you went and it was a trap. So this is the other part of the thing is, yeah, the rainbow, he's walking into a trap and he's, uh, you know, talking to the guy to get the costume. And he says, well, I need this, this. And the guy says, it's not worth my time. I'm a doctor. I don't care. You know, I'll pay you 100 over. It's still not worth my time. I'll pay you 200 over. Now we're talking money. Everybody has their price, you know, so getting them set up and then they hear the noise. And then you just see this big production where he just goes into, you know, going into this room that has a door, locked door, and finding these two Asian guys in drag and in makeup, you know, obviously in fetish gear. And there's pizza on the table, right? The Pizzagate stuff. So that's symbolism. And then you find the underage daughter that had lured these two Asian guys into the room. And of course, he's playing the outraged father. She flees out, leaving the two Asian guys trapped in this man trap. And then you see the girl who's obviously underage start selling her wares to the doctor starting flirting heavily seductive flirting with the doctors like you like what you see do you want to play you know that kind of thing and this is where i really wonder uh of this parts of the film that were supposed to leave, supposedly uh delete it uh because it's interesting you know that originally they said from the original director's cut up to 30 minutes was removed now they're saying that, well, the new HD 
version has all the stuff in it uh, that uh, actually has the sex scenes that were imposed over where they did you know CGI graphics to block the you know, very visible sex scenes. But you know, I just wonder, is that the case or was Kubrick trying to really go down that dark avenue of the pedophilia that's also associated with these secret societies like Jeffrey Epstein and using underage girls as traps to blackmail people. And so they finish their business and the guy gets the coat and everything. And, you know, but he's playing like this outraged father scaring these Asian guys to death, right? That what he's, you know, that uh, they're in so much trouble. And of course, the uh, girls like, you know, nothing's happening. So I'm just thinking of these MK Ultra children that were from birth programmed to be sex slaves and that they have no morality. They're all about being the little animalistic, you know, rabbits and bunnies, sex toys for whoever they're told to be for. And this is, you know, the really creepy part of this. Um, but anyway, so now he has, you know, what he needs to get to the party. But I just thought those were some very, um, you know, disturbing parts of that scene. So back to you. Thanks for that, Mike. I didn't notice the pizza scene, actually. That's interesting. And also, betwixt when you mentioned um, what did she whisper in his ear I was trying to pick that up and I didn't quite get it so um, just do you want to just repeat that one again just so people will uh, if they want to go back and listen to that little snippet because I, I found that hard yeah to sure yeah, she said yeah. she said you should have a cloak lined with ermine ermine all right yeah okay yeah that's that's what we're looking into there all right <laughs> Anyway, we'll move on because we're nearly even halfway through. We're gone an hour and a half already, nearly. <laughs> anyway, we're going. Uh, so Bill now, he's got his costume. He gets into a taxi, drives way out into the country. And uh, $74 taxi fare. And he says, I'll, I'll add another 100 I'll give you. He tears a $100 bill in, in half, he gives you one half. And you wait, it could be 10 minutes, could be an hour. And there's two guys standing outside the gates of this big place and he's saying, yes, sir, can I help you? And he just, um, you're looking for a password? Says, yeah, uh, Fidelio. OK, sir, come on in. So in they go and he walks in through the front door, this huge, big mansion. And um, you can hear these this eerie chanting and music. Uh, th this is the this is the freaky bit. Like, uh, I think a lot of people who know about this film will, will always remember this scene um <clears throat> so he walks in he's masked well, he doesn't have a mask on initially which i thought was strange um maybe you guys might have your thoughts on that but when he does go in then he puts on the mask because the guys who open the door and the guy the bouncers at the gates would have seen who he was right so they knew who he was but he puts on the mask anyway walks in and uh you know he sees uh, this guy dressed in a purple type robe and he's chanting and he's uh, got an incense, uh, waving incense chalice around. And it's very satanic, I have to say, very dark. And the women are also uh, standing around, but they're also hooded, but then they undress and they're, they're naked other than thongs that they're wearing. And um, then uh, at, at, at the end of that little scene, then each, the, all the women start kissing each other and then they go and pick their partners and they go into other rooms where there's basically a mass orgy taking place. And also while Bill is there, he looks up onto a balcony and there's two people there. We, we don't know who they were, probably Ziegler and his wife, I would think. Because the word has come through that he's that Bill is now there, so they look down at him and they nod to him and he nods back. And they continue watching the ceremony. And um, so, yeah, there's just a, this, uh, a very sexually graphic scene where like, you know, it, it, it's it's quite there. As I said, this is a very much an adults only movie, you know, don't be watching this with kids. 
uh, where you see like a mass orgy pretty much taking place. And um, but one of the women, uh, who the woman who comes up and chooses Bill, um, brings him to one side and starts warning him that he's in danger and he shouldn't be here. You know, so like get out now while you can. And he. He doesn't want to do that. He still keeps going, walking around. And uh, obviously, uh, the people who are there know there's a kind of an imposter here, but they know, no, this is this is the guy that we really wanted to bring in here. So we just test him and see what he does. So again, he, uh, a butler in a mask comes up to him. Another, you know, a butler interrupts. There's always a butler or a waiter that interrupts somewhere or a phone call, as you said. There's always something that interrupts and says, oh, there's a taxi guy outside. Wants to know what's going on. Can you come out and talk to him this way, please? And then he's brought into this other room where there's this guy sitting there. Uh, it, it, it looks like the head honcho. Um, basically asking him, like, you know, uh, what are you doing here? And then it was, uh, you know, the, the camera goes around the group and these hor horrendous masks, you know, horrible looking masks, right? And you think, oh my God, this is a house of horrors here, you know? And uh, they said, okay, so you got the, the, the password. He says, yeah, Fidelio. And he says, yeah, but there's another, pa that's only the password into the grounds. What's the password to get into the house? He says, well, uh, I seem to have forgotten that one. Well, that's no good, you know. You, you, uh, you can't allow this. So you're going to have to strip off, take off all your clothes. And God knows what's going to happen then, you know. So poor old Bill now is in a bit of a sticky wicket going on here. What am I going to do here? And um, so he, he proceeds to undress and then the woman who was trying to warn him is standing up on the balcony and says, don't leave him alone. I will redeem him. You know, we talk about redemption as well. And this, that's a big theme. This, I will redeem Bill. And, and the guy looks up and he says, are you sure about this? And he says, yes, I will. Because once you do this, there's no going back. He says, I am ready to redeem this man. Please let him go. So they, 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 they said, OK, you're free to go. And then he asks, well, what's going to happen to that woman? And he says, well, there's no going back for her. And of course, so now Bill's his face, my God, what are they going to do? Are they going to kill her? What's what's going to happen? And well, as we see further on down the line, that something does indeed happen to this woman. But uh, so he, he gets out there intact. Uh, so we'll just talk about that scene there because this is the scene that everyone remembers of this this film. So betwixt back to you on this one. It's a very impressive scene. I think Bill is completely naive to what he's walking into because as as you said, Bryzer, he doesn't put the mask on until he's inside, you know, he's more or less inside the event. And I think, you know, he takes off his jacket and he hands it and there's the receipt for the cloak and the mask with his name on it. So he, he really doesn't know what he's getting into here. I think he had no idea. He just thought it was going to be a well-to-do erotic uh, party. And he even, like, he doesn't seem to get it because, you know, I have to say, by the way, the, this is this is a, a, a very well shot scene and it must have taken them ages like weeks and weeks and weeks to get this right the choreography uh, everything but there is a part where he's uh, he's looking up and there are two masked individuals on the balcony looking down at him and they seem to be discussing him and he looks up at them and then they nod at him and then he nods at them and it's i think he he thinks he's he's gotten away with it you know that no one <laughs> <laughs> no one is any the wiser, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, they have, they've seen his face coming in. They know who he is. And uh, we get into it later, the woman who redeems him, who uh, saves his life. But uh, obviously, if you're if you're going to save a life in this place, that means uh, you're, you're sacrificing your own. 
as I say, Bill doesn't understand. Even even when he's seen all the orgies and he's walked around, you know, he still doesn't get how how dangerous the situation is. And when this woman warns him and tells him, you know, you must leave now, he very foolishly tries to remove her mask and she has to resist. And that's when the, you know, the individuals come to him and say, you know, your driver, your taxi driver is outside, which is just a ruse to get him into that big central chamber. But yeah, it's it's a very impressive scene and I pass it back. Okay, Blackbird. Great points. Yeah, this is the scene everybody always associates the movie with. And yeah, this is where all of the Masonic Illuminati type uh, symbolism really comes out. And that he thinks he's just going to a weird, posh, artsy, rich people Christmas party. And he doesn't realize that he is trespassing on basically a very you know, uh, dark ritual that they are doing and he is an outsider he is a profane and they are going to treat him as such if he doesn't get out immediately and so you see you know he you know, gets through the gate and then he gets through the front door and uh, this just reminds me of those fertility cult systems like uh, in Jericho and AI and Sodom and Gomorrah, where all of those early walled cities were circular shaped. And, you know, the uh, more inner circle you were, the greater your status was. And so this party is one of those where, you know, can you get onto the grounds? Can you get past the gate? Then can you get in the front door where the party is? And then there's the second floor, you know, the party uh, that you get invited to. And then there's, of course, the inner circle type party, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and each one has its secrets associated with it, right? Uh, and so this idea of him coming in and you see this uh, opening ceremony ritual obviously satanic in a circle with the seven, excuse me, the 11 priestesses, you know, the sacred prostitutes in the circle around the main guy with the you know, incense sensor, and they're playing this really bizarre music. You know, there's Nick uh, Nightingale blindfolded playing this really you know, bizarre trancey music while this is going on, and they're chanting. Uh, as the opening ceremony, and then the, you know, uh, sacred prostitutes or whatever disrobe, uh, leaving us their panties, their masks, and their high heels, right? And you see this woman that we are recognizing that he immediately is out of place. You have the people on the balcony realizing that we have somebody out of place. We need to intercede. So they lure him with the lie of, your, ta your driver needs to speak to you. They come into the room and ask him for the second password. And you know, this was one of the things in the Freemason uh, blood oath system that if you don't have those passwords, they have the right to kill you. That is what blood ritual is all about. You know, each one of the various degrees had their passwords of entry, right? And so this idea of, you know, what's the password for the, you know, for here? And he didn't know. And again, it's a trick question. You find out later that, well, there wasn't a second password. And that is one of the tricks of the occult is that thing that's not there. Um, it's uh, yeah, so that idea of, you know, you can't answer a question that doesn't exist. Right. And then, you know, they demask him and, you know, tell him to get undressed. And, you know, you have no idea what they're going to do to him. And then one of the priestesses on the balcony with authority. This is the thing. You know, these were not just hired prostitutes as we're led to believe for this posh party. Yeah, you know, this person is in, with authority saying, let him go. I will stand in his place. I will redeem him, right? 
And this is part of blood culture. You know, it's all about keeping the books balanced. Come, you know, harvest time. How many people do you have? How many mouths to feed? How much food do you have? Therefore, this many people need to die. These are the people on the naughty list, but we just need somebody to die. So if you're on the naughty list and you pay somebody to take your place or you have a scapegoat or you know, if you got a chicken handy, you could sacrifice like they do it. Uh, you know, Yom Kippur, you know, that idea of just, we just need a blood sacrifice for, to atone for this crime. And this woman saying, he isn't innocent. He doesn't know what's going on. I will redeem him for whatever her reasons were. Uh, and so this idea of a life for a life. And then the warning about, you know, we know who you are. If you ever reveal anything about what you've seen here, you know, we will come after you. We'll come after your family. You know, you have no idea how you know much we can put a hurting on you uh, if you betray what you see. And, you know, one of the things, of course, in the dance scene, as he's walking through and everybody's dancing, is a lot of homosexuality. And you wonder if in other scenes there were scenes with pedophilia going on that didn't make the cut but you know whatever people wanted at this big orgy they were could have right um and so you know he is you know, you know told to leave the party you know and uh that if he says anything they'll kill him right so uh back to you yeah, uh, interesting. And the thing is, Bill should have kind of clicked because Nick, who gave him the password, he was in the house. OK, OK, he was blindfolded, but he was in the house. Yeah. So uh, he got in. So he should have uh, asked that question. Well, how, how did he get in here then? You know. But he didn't <coughs> figure that, that one out. Um, yeah. Uh, so, okay, that, that whole scene ends, uh, a very disturbing scene. And um, so he goes home, it's early in the morning, and um, <clears throat> he comes in quietly into the apartment and he, he has his costume with him and, uh, in a bag and he hides it in a, in a cupboard and um, uh, and then he goes into the bedroom and Alice is, is asleep and she's laughing in her sleep and then he uh, <clears throat> he wakes her up and then she said she was having a dream where she was actually having sex with that naval officer and not only him but many other men <clears throat> and laughing because Bill was watching them doing it so so there he was at this orgy watching all these other people having sex. And then she, he comes home and there she is telling him that she was having a dream where the same thing was going on. So uh, Bill is in a, you know, you, you can, he's, in a, he's in a terrible state right now. And uh, so he needs to go and find Nick. And see what he knows what what's, what's going on here and um, he goes to the jazz club that's closed he goes into the coffee shop next door and said do you know nick who plays in here and says, oh yeah he comes in here often so do you know where he's staying and then again as you know he produces i'm a doctor he produces that old id all the time i'm a doctor trust me he says, oh yeah oh you're a doctor okay yeah so she obviously tells him what hotel he's in so he goes to the hotel and uh, the the desk clerk there, who is obviously gay as you can get, right, <laughs> um, says, uh, well, uh, Nick is gone. I know he's, he's checked out. He checked out early this morning, uh, like five o'clock in the morning. And uh, Bill says, that's a bit early for checkout. He says, yeah, well, it, it does happen. You know, that's the way it is. But basically tells him, though, that two other men came with him came into the hotel and got him out and they checked out and, and that Nick had a, a, a bruise on his cheek. And uh, they was just pushed into a car and off they went. And uh, that was the end of, well, we don't know what happened to Nick after that. Um, 
either he was threatened or whatever and told to shut up or else because you know we do know that he has a family back in seattle four kids so he's going to keep his mouth shut so uh so then bill decides to return the costume and um and and uh, Milich is there. Oh yeah, the tuxedo, the cloak, and uh, oh, where's the mask? And uh, Bill's going, oh, I don't know. Says, oh, you might have left it behind at the party. And he says, yeah, I don't know about that. I, I, he, he wasn't sure what happened to the mask. Um, but obviously he was confused through all this time, so maybe he did forget it. Uh, but anyway, um, Bill says, yeah, just throw it on the bill. I'll, I'll pay for that as well. Right? So he settles all of that. And then at that point, again, we're back into this rainbow shop again. And the two Asian guys come out again. It's time they're dressed, looking normal. And they're like, thank you very much. You know, everything. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. OK. And the daughter comes out again, scantily clad. And basically, Milich implies that he is pimping out his daughter for sex. That that's that's with whoever. Um, again, it's just dark, and that's where the whole pedophilia side of it comes into. As you mentioned, Blackbird, you know the uh, he was obviously pushing that envelope, and he he was putting it out there, and maybe he put out a little bit too much that he he shouldn't have had. And is that the reason why he died a few, you know, of a heart attack when Kubrick died of a heart attack when he did not actually have any heart problems, uh, like a, a few days afterwards? It's like it's, it's very odd, but that was definitely implied. There. There's no doubt about that. The paedophilia was implied because that that young girl was 13 or 14, no older. You could see it, you know. So. Um, Yeah, so then, yeah, we we'll move on from there. So we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. So he he um, he he, leave, he goes to work. He's, he's trying to figure out what he's got to do. He, he's really he's in a very bad place at this moment. So he, he decides to go to the to back to the to the big mansion where the orgy was happening. Um, I don't know why he was doing that, but I think he maybe just wanted to confront them or something, you know. But really, at the end of the day, it was Bill's fault for going there in the first place, you know. So what, what was he going to gain by, by coming back there? So he went back anyway, and he was handed an envelope and with a warning basically to stay away or else. And that, and that was it, right? So um, then uh, Bill, I think he tries to call that woman Marion, the, the, the woman whose father died. Um, maybe to talk with her or something about things, but uh, she didn't pick up the fiance answered. So he hung up and then she, he goes to see if Domino, the prostitute is in her apartment. And uh, I think this time he's saying, yeah, I want I want now to have sex with you now, right? And, and that's it. I just I think he just needed to do this uh, you know he, he there was just so much tension and everything and he just if he if he has sex with somebody this will just satiate these the desires he had because as you said he went into this orgy I think it was just going to be yeah, yeah you know crazy orgy everyone drinking doing drugs whatever and having sex with whoever right but it was a lot deeper and darker than that and he, he was like that obviously took him aback and he was lucky to get away with his life when you think about it right well that's what he was thinking so anyway he um he's met by uh the roommate sally who wasn't there the first time and sally let him in you know it says oh i've got a present like a cake or something and um, so she lets him in and they have a bit of a talk and there was a bit of again a bit of a come on there as well from Sally was you know like you know because the two of them are obviously as you said Blackbird obviously student types right clever enough girls but they're staying in this kind of crummy little apartment and as you said uh, 
furniture isn't great. There's food left out all over the place. You know, it's 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 not the, the nicest place to live. It's in a dodgy part of town. And so the two of them were just trying to pay their student loans or whatever, right? And um, but then Sally informs Bill that Domino had received news that she was HIV positive. And uh, I think Sally thought probably that Bill and Domino had sex and uh, she didn't want to bring it up. I thought that, uh, well, if she's HIV positive, then maybe he is, you know. Um, well, you know, we can all go into whether the whole HIV thing, uh, that's another thing. But anyway, that, uh, obviously Bill again is very sad to hear about that and he leaves. So um, yeah, we leave it. At, I leave it at that. So over to you, Betwixt, for your take on those two scenes after the after the um, the party and what what happens then. When he goes back to to his flat, and he finds his wife uh, asleep, but she's laughing in her dream, and then. He wakes her up, I think, and because he thinks she's having a nightmare. And then she explains the dream. And but she doesn't explain all of it. You know, she's very coy. And he then presses her and says, come on, uh, there's more to it. And more or less, she, she says that the dream was about. They were naked. So I, I, when I watched this, I was thinking of the Garden of Eden. But it's kind of it's kind of being turned upside down because uh, in this case, he's the one. He's the one who has made them naked. He's the one that chased the forbidden fruit. He's the one that went to that party. And now they're, you know, as a couple, they're vulnerable because very, very powerful people are out to get them or at least have have marked their cards in to some degree. So. She's laughing at him. She's mocking him, uh, whatever, subconsciously, without the knowledge of this. And in her dream, she's laughing at him as she's being screwed by not just the whatever naval officer, but by loads of different men. And as she's being fucked, he's watching her in the dream and she's being fucked, but she's laughing at the same time. She's laughing at him. She's mocking him now. He's again absolutely shocked hearing this. This is something he can't control. This is something, you know, in, in real life, in, in the waking world, you know, she can smile, she can speak softly, she can lie. But in this case, this is something deep down in the roots. And deep down in the roots, it seems she absolutely loads her husband. And he can't really do anything about that. He goes to, yeah, he goes to the prostitute's apartment and yeah, there, there's chemistry there with the other girl. It's a small apartment and there's the part where she tries to go to the other side of the table and he's standing in between and they're kind of pressed against each other. And then eventually, you know, it looks like they're going to have sex. He's starting to take off his, uh, he takes off his jacket. He starts uh, cupping her breasts. And then she says, well, actually, I need to tell you something. And then she tells tells him about her her flatmate having uh, HIV, whatever, which means that, well, especially back in 1999, that uh, Nick has dodged a, a bullet. He's dodged a bullet. He was lucky that he didn't have sex with her. He was lucky that his wife called him that, you know, that night, um, which kind of put a dampener on, on the on the romance with the with the prostitute. Yeah, just just to tell you, that was the second time he dodged a bullet because the first time was at that orgy, you know, when they got him to take off all his clothes and unmask him. That's he right. He dodged a bullet there and now he dodged another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, he doesn't seem to learn because, as you said, he, he goes he goes back to the the mansion wherein the the orgy party was held. And I think that's a brilliant scene because it's one of the few daylight scenes. Everything else seems to be nighttime. But I just think it's a great scene. He, he's he's come from his job. He, he's got the car. He drives down and he's at the end of this really long avenue. And he's be, he's behind bars. You know, he's being kept out. 
And I think he really wants to be, I, I think he wants to be a member of that club, but they're not going to have him. They're not going to have him. And uh, they've, they've deemed him untrustworthy. And he's behind bars. He's behind the gate. And this very stern looking man drives down to the gate and hands him the envelope and more or less telling him, <laughs> telling him to fuck off, you know, just to, to, for, you know, to stop hassling them or, or things are going to turn very sour for him, you know. So, yeah, that's that. And I pass it back to you, Bryzer and Blackbird. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, good point there. Yeah, that's why I was wondering why he went back. Um, was he going there to confront them or did he say, I want in? And I gave, what, it was because he was upset of what his wife told him when he woke her up when he came back, you know. And it just it went to another level because the first time when they were in bed and they were smoking the weed and they were talking about it, you know, oh, he fantasized about this naval officer. And now it's gotten worse that it was not the naval officer, but there was a load of other men basically, yeah, fucking her, okay? And he was watching and they were laughing at him. So he wanted kind of revenge. So I was just interested to get your thoughts on that point, why he went back there. But anyway, as you said, they gave him the envelope, told him, on your bike, get out of here, or else, you know, we know where you live, we know who you are, and that's it. you got a big career, leave us alone, or else we, we know where you are. So, Blackbird, you know, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, excellent points in these very powerful scenes that, you know, he's sneaking into the house, he's hiding his costume, locking it, you know, thinking his secret safe. Then he goes and looks in his daughter's room. And so this idea of, you know, at what point uh, does this innocent child become one of these women, you know, that he's dealing with, right? And so this is another where place where, you know, Kubrick is really pushing the envelope there on sexuality of, you know, uh, the feminine and at what stage you know, is it developed, right? And uh, then you again to see the Christmas tree. This, you know, the family Christmas tree still has an angel on it. Um, and the wife's having the nightmare, but then you find out that it's the, you know, uh, her having sex and laughing at him, you know, being cucked about it, right? This is the, that, you know, just the probably one of the most cruel things the woman can do in vindictiveness is to, you know, not only am I going to have sex with all these people, I'm going to make you watch. So that's just such a powerful image of, you know, that power of sexuality. That it's a weapon. You can use sex as a weapon. And uh, then, uh, and also, yes, that archetype of being played the fool. Everybody hates being played the fool. Then, of course, you're talking about the next day where he goes back to, uh, looking for his friend, the club's closed. You uh, return the costume, and you see, you know, the play out of what happened after when the deal was made with the Asian gentleman, uh, and that they're leaving very satisfied. Uh, and the daughter obviously, you know, did them right, and so it's just that trap of you have somebody at the disadvantage. And then you can negotiate, right? So you know, this is your know, power politics here. I can call the authorities and say, you raped my daughter. It would be the end of your careers, you know, this, that, and the other. Or, you know, you can have the night you want it, but it's just going to cost you. And, you know, you see them leaving all on best of terms. And so you see this was just a big performance to use the daughter to entrap the men to blackmail them into making a lot of money and creating new clients yeah they'll probably come there every time they go to new york now from japan and then uh the uh going to the cafe gillespie's cafe and you know the music that's playing is you know this motown song and he's uh flirting with the you know the waitress or whatever and getting the information about we are Nick's staying and you know this that I'm a doctor again like you were saying 
the very homosexual clerk trying to flirt with them and then finding out about the big guys and that he had a bruise on the face, tried to pass an envelope, but they intercepted it. Um, and then, you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, coming home or uh, when he's cashing in the uh, costumes, the mask is mi missing, so he has to pay for the mask. Uh, and uh, then you just see him again going through these loops of his wife having sex with this Navy captain and he just can't get it out of his mind. So he clears his schedule for the afternoon and drives out to where the party was. And he's again outside the gate and the Stern guys drive up in the very expensive car and give him the letter to him. It's addressed to him. We know who you are. And so they have put it in writing. They are casting a spell. This is your second warning. You need to drop this. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's just, again, what was his motive? Was he looking for his friend? What happened to his friend? Or was he, you know, saying, okay, I may have screwed up, but what's going on here? You know, can, you know, can I be a member of your club? You know, that's interesting dynamic, but you know, is what's driving is this, you know, sexual tension with his wife and all these other women and, you know, really questioning the marital bonds at the season of Christmas. You know, so anyway, back to you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so moving on from then. Um, so Bill Bill leaves the the apartment. Uh, Sally or, or Donald, the two of them live, and he's walking down streets. Uh, this is obviously Greenwich Village. I, I've been there. I know it. It's a it, it it's a seedy area, but it's 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 a kind of a it's a very kind of party kind of place. It's a lot lot of things going on. But he's trying to get a taxi to get out of there. And he notices he's been followed by somebody and, um, and he's thinking, OK, these guys are coming after me now, so I, I got to do something and he can't he can't get a taxi. <clears throat> no, so he stands in front, he's in front of a newsstand and he's watching the guy at a corner. He buys a newspaper and then he walks off and then he, he walks into another coffee shop. It's just there for a while and he reads the, the newspaper article that a former beauty queen uh, died from an overdose. And he recognizes that this could be Mandy from the the first party that they were at. OK. <clears throat> so. Um, he go, <clears throat> you know, he, he, he needs to find this out, so he goes to the hospital again. He shows his ID. I'm a doctor. Blah, blah, blah. Can you give me any information on this Mandy Curran? He says, oh yeah, uh, unfortunately she died at four o'clock this afternoon. And so he obviously says, well, can I go and see her? You know, um, so guy brings her down to the morgue, pulls her out and yeah, it's definitely Mandy. And so he's obviously thinking, well, they killed her, you know. Um, something happened. It wasn't an overdose. Well, like, he, he's not sure, but he, he obviously thinks that they killed her. She she redeemed him. She gave her own life to save him. So this is like, oh, this is a, a tough one for him. So um, later on, I think he, then he gets a phone call from Ziegler and says, come around to the house and uh, so he does and Ziegler's in the pool room uh, come on in you know what, what would you like you know it's just beautiful room you know big pool table and do you play and all that kind of stuff he says, well, sometimes what would you like a scotch uh, Gives him a scotch. Oh, that's really good stuff. Uh, yeah, 25 year old scotch. I'll send you over a case, no problem. This is like a, this would be uh, one bottle is like probably $100, $150 a bottle, you know. This is, this is the best. I, I'll send you over the best, no problem. So, anyway, Ziegler pretty much opens up and tells him what was going on at this whole orgy, that he was there and he knew it was him. 
and um, and that there was actually no second password, right? And um, and that's what outed Bill as the kind of an outsider, and uh, and uh, Ziegler just basically says that listen, they do all this stuff, and they have to be very careful who they let in, and um, you got in, but they let you go, okay? And um, so just leave it, leave it at that. And you carry on being a doctor and all the rest, go back to your normal life, all's fine, okay? But then Bill's not happy because what happened to Mandy? And, you know, and he says, well, no, oh, Mandy's just a drug addict and she, she overdid, she OD'd, she, no, that's it. Uh, no. And he, he's not convinced of that. She, he, he, Bill obviously thinks that they they killed her. And, um, and then he was saying as well that this whole thing could be a fake. This could be a, a kind of, um, uh, you know, just a kind of a show just for him. And uh, and again, Bill was like, what? Like, but somebody's died here. This is, this is not a show. This, this is real. Somebody's died here. Um, and it's just, it, 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 that's why, you know, we got this impression that this was all set up just to check if Bill was the real deal to come in and be a part of this elite club. He obviously wasn't. He obviously had some kind of uh, connection with his own consciousness, his own soul, that he couldn't go along with this, but he, he flirted with it. He was tempted. That's the whole uh, thing I got from this movie was seduction and temptation. Always the hanging fruit there. If you want it, it's there for you if you want it. But if you want it, this is what you need to do. And I'm not sure if Bill wanted to do it, but he tried it. And it nearly ended up him costing his life and um, ruining his marriage, you know. Um, so... Um, yeah, just just get your thoughts on that scene with Bill and Ziegler in that snooker in the in the pool room and having that chat. Because um, as far as Ziegler is concerned, uh, no, she didn't sacrifice herself from him. It was all staged. That's what we do. She just OD'd. Forget it. The cops called it out. The the, the coroner said it. You know, she just overdosed on drugs. And that's it. End of story. Everything's happy. Go back to your own life, Bill. Everything's good, okay? And leave it at that because if you start making inquiries and you start pushing this, well, these people are powerful and they'll come and get you. And okay, over to you, Betwixt, on, on that particular scene. Okay. I just very quickly go back to that final millage scene where he's, you know, he's delighted with the custom he, he's got from the, the good doctor. And he's telling him, you know, if he ever if he ever needs anything else, anything else, and then he he gets his he kind of waves his daughter over and he puts his arm around his daughter, you know, anything else, we're here to serve you. And you know, in the eyes of Millage, his daughter is just one other article in the shop, except she'll she'll never leave that shop. The scene with Ziegler, uh, that pool room is is a beautiful, beautiful room. I have to say, I I was nearly salivating looking at it. You know, you have the bookshelves, you have all these books. It just looks like a really classy room. And Ziegler, the pool table, it's a massive pool table, uh, red felt. And it's really funny. You can see you can see Ziegler is really perplexed about how he's going to you know, have this little chat with uh, with Bill. And he's just he's just like hitting the balls with his hand on the on the table. The, the pool balls he just and he, he I think he says it twice he says it once oh no no I'm not playing I'm just hitting a few balls and then a few seconds later he says no no I'm not playing I'm just and then he doesn't finish the sentence so you can see he, he's really perplexed about how he's going to broach this topic and he tries to smoke Bill out and Bill is like uh, I have no idea what you're talking about and then he says uh, Bill I was there <laughs> I saw everything you know and yeah he it's very well done because Ziegler, he's kind of saying maybe it was just a charade, maybe it was real. And then when when he's asked about Nick, he says, you know, I saw um, 
uh, you know, the guy at the hotel told me that Nick uh, at three o'clock in the morning or something, he came with with two men and, he, and Nick had bruises on his face. And Ziegler says, oh, well, you know, he got away lightly, if you ask me. You know, he, he deserves so much more for spilling the beans. And when Bill asks him, you know, is, is, is Nick... Is Nick okay? Is he is he dead or what's happened to Nick? Uh, Ziegler, again, that suggestive language. Oh, who knows? Who knows? Maybe he's back in Seattle banging uh, Mrs. Nick or something like that. So, yeah, it's a very good scene as well. And I think uh, Ziegler has obviously pulled a few strings for Bill. I think Ziegler has redeemed Bill uh, the same way Bill redeemed Ziegler at the very start of the movie when he, you know, brought that um, that girl, that uh, hooker, um, back to life, more or less. Uh, she was on the way out and he brought her back. So I think Ziegler has, has vouched for him. That girl obviously redeemed Bill. She saved Bill's life at that party. But Bill was given a warning. Don't ever come back, don't ask any questions, but Bill couldn't do that. So I think Ziegler has redeemed him now. And after that, I, I'm guessing if Bill, you know, if he continues trying to find things out, then I think that's it. He, he's, his life is, is finished. They're, they're going to go for him. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, Blackbird, your thoughts on that bit? Because <clears throat> this is where, again, I, you made a good point there betwixt because, yeah, I didn't think about that where, uh, maybe Ziegler did actually redeem Bill and said, well, I brought you into this. You know, uh, I don't really know you. I invited you to my Christmas party, which was great. And and I brought you in and maybe I was testing you to see where it went. And we figured out maybe you're not the guy that we want. We thought you might be, but you're not. So we let you off. And well, and we didn't kill that woman. You know, we it, it was fake. You know, it, it, it didn't really happen. She was a drug addict and whatever. I don't. I don't know if Bill's yeah. convinced about that because I he think says he says as well that the wasn't it the the apartment door was locked from the inside. Yeah, yeah. So um. So yeah, the, and and we do know about these people how they operate. Okay, that they um. If you go against the grain, uh, that's it. And you, as you said, Blackbird. Uh, when it comes to Freemasonry and that, if you step out of line, there's a good chance they will come after you and get you, you know. And how many people have we been seeing who are, well, look at Kubrick, who was heart attacked or suicided, you know. We, we see it so many times, people who who step out and start speaking out, they, they're taken care of very quickly, you know. So it kind of left that open too. So Blackbird, you know, what's your thoughts on that one? Oh, great points. Yeah, this is the, definitely another turn in the film where not only has he gotten his second warning, but now he's discovering that somebody is following him and he's not able to get a taxi cab, you know, the checkered board taxis. You know, you think of that image that suddenly he, his money's no good. He's being shunned uh, and somebody's following him. And he goes to a newsstand and buys a newspaper and it's a New York Post and the headline is lucky to be alive. Right. So he grabs. <laughs> I love that headline. Lucky to be alive. And he takes that newspaper and goes into the uh, coffee shop. And uh, that's when he reads the article that Amanda is you know, the former beauty queen that was you know, working on her film career, et cetera, was found dead. And he goes to the hospital to look for her as a doctor, you know, so he's got the credential that this is my patient. I need to see her in the morgue. And he realizes who she is and he starts putting the connections between, you know, her quote of I will redeem him at the party. And this was the woman that he had helped at Ziegler's party earlier that had overdosed. And, um, you know, so he's putting all these pieces together and at the hospital, you know, the piece of artwork that they use is very significant. It's a piece by, um, pull this up, Jan Hayworth, and it's called 
the uh, Aunt Gertie Burning from 1995. So Aunt Gertie Burning, and it's about her father's sister. And it's this obvious, you know, person being murdered, you know, very abstract pop art. You know, Jan Hayworth became a leading member of the British pop art movement in the 60s, and she was big pals with Peter Blake. And she is also one of the people who designed the Sgt. Pepper album. And we could do a whole show about, you know, what happened to Paul McCartney and all the symbolism on that Sgt. Pepper album. But this is the piece of artwork that they used uh, called the burning of Aunt Gertie and it's like was Aunt Gertie taken out by this same type of cabal and so that the hospital actually has this piece of artwork it was kind of disturbing but uh, yeah this was a Kubrick fast uh, you know really you know, honed in on and then um, he goes to see Ziegler. You know, Ziegler basically summons him like, I, I need to talk to you. You know, we, we, we need to have a talk about what's going on. And this is the, okay, you know, you are in danger. You know, you don't understand what's going on. You have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. You know, your friend, you know, I stuck my neck out for him. He betrayed us. You know, he got off easy with you know just getting beaten up a little bit but you know he'll never work in this town again kind of thing so you don't know if the guy was put on a plane back to seattle or if he's you know also dead for betraying the confidence of these people because they play hardball you know they don't tolerate anybody exposing them at all um and you know so it's just interesting how ziggler is handling this is you know I was there. You have no idea what you're doing. You just need to drop it. And, you know, she was just a prostitute. And it's like, you know, it's obvious that she wasn't, but they're just trying to get this guy to drop it and don't go, you know, seeking that anymore. That has been closed to you. And if you don't acknowledge it's been closed to you, then, you know, we will go against your family. So this implied threat that they're going to go after his wife and daughter at this point is very, very real in the photo, you know, in the movie. So back to you. Yeah, good, good points there, guys. And we're coming up to kind of the end of the movie now. Which is another an interesting scene. Um, so he comes home and he finds that the mask that he thought he had lost. Uh, so he walks into the bedroom and he finds the mask on the on his pillow beside Alice. And he's like, oh, man. So obviously Alice heard him coming in the previous night. Found the bag hidden in the cupboard, took the mask out and then Bill obviously returned the rest of it. But Bill didn't didn't know what happened to the mask, whatever. And then he sees the mask on the pillow. <clears throat> and, uh, it's this whole thing about masks, isn't it? Like, is it him? What are masks? You know, when we think about what's happened over the last couple of years, the masking, you know? Uh, you know, if, what are you if you wear a mask? You're not yourself. You're, you're disguising yourself, you know? So who, 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 she's basically saying, who am I married to? Am I married to you or this mask here? You know, what's, what's going on? So... So Bill breaks down anyway, cries <clears throat> and uh, confesses to him, basically tells her everything, uh, the whole thing. Two of them are sitting over the breakfast table. She's looking a bit haggard as well. And I think she knows as well that she played her part in all of this too. And um, it, it obviously had to come to that point in their marriage that, yeah, they were a successful couple. They had everything and they thought they could just go out and play around and do whatever. And it doesn't it doesn't work that way. You know, uh, there's more to it. And what about their daughter? And um, so they decide to go Christmas shopping with their daughter. 
and Bill apologised to Alice, but I, I noticed one thing about towards the end of that film, in, in the toy shop, you notice it was all children's toys, teddy bears, dolls, you know, there was a Barbie doll in there, I think, somewhere. And this is going back to the children again, you know, bringing that side of it into it, you know. Uh, uh, just making that little subtle point that is this what's really going on in these orgies, that it's not actually prostitutes or, uh, you know, well-paid models who, uh, you know, who, who, who put stuff in your drink and, and then, you know, have sex with you and everything, and, and then you get photographed and then you're blackmailed, but it's actually children. And you always notice with, when it comes to, there's always teddy bears, there's always little children's toys. You always see that, eh? and that kind of um, stirs the emotions when you kind of see how they uh, use children in this kind of thing. You know, they're, these are the innocent victims. These are innocent kids, right, who do not know what's going on. They're just they're starting off in life, and they're being used in these uh, these wretched people's heads as playthings, you know, and. And then at the end of it, it was a very strange way it ended, you know, it says Alice suggests that they have to do something as soon as possible. And Bill asks what she means. And Alice simply responds with one word. You need to go home and fuck. And that was it. So I'll pass back to uh, Betwixt on that final scene. Yeah, the mask. When when I watched it recently, I thought that Bill had left it at the sex orgy party. And I thought that they had, you know, some of their members had got into his apartment at night and put it beside his sleeping wife as a, as a warning. That's what I thought when I saw it. And then I thought a bit more about it. And then I read, read up a bit and... It said that she put it there, the wife put it there. And if that's the case, I could only assume that she prefers the mask to the familiar face of her husband. She prefers anonymity to familiarity. And that's not going to change. Now, you said, Bryzer, you know, the final scene, it's, it is strange. And the final word in the film, after all that dialogue, after some incredible dialogue, excellent scenes, the final word, and it's said quite uh, intensely, is fuck. fuck. Yeah. That's the final word. And that was the whole theme of the movie. Yeah. It was all about sex and seduction yeah. and temptation. Yeah. And I might browser actually, if because I know I know you're a bit strapped for time. No, we're all, we're all right for a bit. We're all right. I'm not sure about yeah. how Blackbird is for time either. Yeah. I I'm going to read at the very end if possible. Yeah. Uh, it's a three minute. It'll take me three minutes or four minutes to read it. It's an excerpt yeah. from a novel that I started reading yesterday, and I think it ties in a bit to this idea of, you know, kind of turning humans into animals with just you know constant sexual desires, uh, constant need for copulation. But yeah, when she says that, we're going to go home and you're, you, you've got to promise you're going to do something for me. And then she says, you know, we need to fuck. And what that says is that in this uh, marriage, in this family, uh, there can never be a sense of closure. There can never be a sense of harmony and more or less as as the film finishes and if it, it's a it's a very sudden end like there's no kind of fade out or anything like that it just goes black it, it just goes that's it credits come up you get the note you get the impression that after everything you know that bill has been through that she's been through uh, they're trying to make it work uh, but the idea is bill is on probation <laughs> he's he's on probation he'll never be off probation as soon as she decides she doesn't want him anymore he's gone he's out he's out on his ear he's gone and it's up to him to keep her happy it's up to him to satisfy her and to satisfy her 
you know, it's not uh, it's not in terms of financial support. It's not in terms of emotional support, really. It's uh, sexual fulfillment, and that's it. Yeah. Instead of saying, let's go home and make love, which is what, which that's the proper term, really, for it, isn't it? Make love. But it's fuck, which is this carnal, carnalistic, animalistic attitude. If we do that, everything will be fine. And it, it, it's a strange ending. I, I, I didn't know what to kind of make of it, but I, that's. It just said that to me. It said this is not over. I, you know, there's going to be still more problems in this in this marriage. So Blackbird, over to you for that final scene. Great observations and. I guess one of the things that stuck out to me getting back to the pedophilia. Oh, and I'm fine for time. We've talked to our, our contact. I've got a show after the Bryzer and I have a show after this. But anyway, so we're good on time. Um, what would be a Stanley Kubrick movie without, you know, review without it going long, right? We've got to get the details like Kubrick, right? But anyway, um, when he's coming home and again there's the christmas tree with the angel on top uh but it looks like the angel it's like a red light now behind the angel instead of a white light right and as he's looking at the kitchen table there are where they had had you know treats earlier and you have these red bright red silly straws that are in the spirals, very shaped spirals. And one of the things about the symbols used to identify these pedophilia networks is the pedophile uh, triangles within triangles, circles within circles. They've corrupted the sacred spiral with their symbolism, you know, where a spiral and a triangle within a triangle is code for these uh, pedophiles uh, and to see that image of the silly straws on the kitchen table but in those pedophile symbols uh, is just you know the implications that you know his daughter could be kidnapped and brought in as a sex slave uh, to these people you know that kind of uh, dark imagery of Kubrick <clears throat> and then you see him getting a beer out that's one of the go-to's is every time he comes home he just gets opens a beer uh, yeah, it's not like a fancy import beer it's just the goyim coming home and opening a can of beer um, and then I guess the shocking image of him coming into the bedroom and thinking he's got everything covered he's got all his lies everything's covered we can finally move past this and there is the mask he wore at the party uh, on his pillow in his marriage bed and his sleeping wife next to him and that is his breaking point where he just you know breaks down and confesses to her everything and you can tell they're up all night hashing all the nuances out of this and then they're going to take their daughter Christmas shopping the next day. And so you have this, you know, sudden immersion into normalcy. Christmas season, you know, it's almost Christmas. You're in the toy store of a posh New York toy store, right? And, you know, what could be more Christmassy than that? And the bear symbolism, that there are bears everywhere. And... You know, then this one Barbie doll character, but all of these bear images and, you know, teddy bears always look nice, uh, but, you know, real bears aren't so much, you know, real bears will kill you. And you know, this idea of you're surrounded by these bears that are watching you. Uh, and so the implied threat there, this, you know, they're still being watched. Um by something that could do them harm and they're trying to protect their child and give her a normal happy christmas and one of the things she does is goes up to a baby carriage and it's this old victorian style baby carriage and they're just like wow that's you know such a long time ago where we had things like baby carriages 
uh, and that's that symbol of innocence that you know and uh, the idea of robbing the baby carriage of stealing the child you know is part of those archetypal fears parents have that you know their child will be abducted by bears uh, you know that the, there are entities out there that would want to harm your children and then it just takes the turn of you know we need to go home and like you said it wasn't we need to go home and make love it's just we need to go have animal sex and this that's going to make everything fine somehow um so it's just again that this idea of you know chasing eroticism and sexual satisfaction and you know fantasies you know to the detriment of a healthy functioning marriage and a healthy functioning family uh, so again you see like i said in the beginning these two systems that are completely opposite one another uh, that are battling uh, for you know, the future of you know, what society going to be. Are we going to be a, ruled by the Jeffrey Epstein's, the Ghislaine Maxwell's, the Max, uh, Lex, Lex Mac, uh, Waxner of the world that you know, basically just treats everybody like commodities and you know, women are you know, prostitutes and, you know, uh, homosexuality is normal and it's all about, you know, uh, fulfilling your passions and, you know, you can have anything if you're powerful enough and everybody strives to be part of that beautiful people circle of the celebrities and all, but it's very, very dark when you get into that party. You know, that's one of the things. Everybody always wants to get invited to the party. But once you get you know invited to the party, you realize that you can never leave. Uh, you know that's always going to follow you around. So I guess that's my thoughts on how he ended the film. So back to you. Okay, guys, we'll uh, we'll kind of wind it up. We'll give our final thoughts. I'll, I'll start with Betwixt and um, and give it uh, give it our score out of ten, and then we'll we'll call it a day after that. I mean, we've gone for two and a half hours, but I think it deserved it because. This this is one hell of a movie. So betwixt your final thoughts. All right, yeah. So I'll speak for a few minutes here, Bryzer, if that's all right with you. Okay. So no problem at all. Yeah, yeah I don't want to keep you. So no um, getting back to what Blackboard said, when yeah, when she wakes up, when the wife wakes up and she sees her husband uh, sitting on the bed, bawling his eyes out. When I saw that, I thought, yeah, this this uh, this marriage is over because she's attracted to kind of like a military men, uh, you know, steely, steely men. She's not going to be attracted to, to this husband of hers who's, who's bawling his eyes out. Obviously, he's been put through the mill. He, he's, his whole world has been turned upside down, but she doesn't know that yet. Obviously, she finds out later, but I just think the idea of her waking up and seeing her husband crying uh, his eyes out just is going to make the, the marriage uh, much sourer. Uh, also, you know, I think she says something when uh, the final scene, she says, you know, we're awake now. And he says forever. And she says, oh, no, no, no. The word forever, like it scares her. She says that word scares me, which which is very telling as well. <laughs> as I said, he's on probation. Now, I'll read this very quickly, Bryzer. Uh, yeah. And before I do so, I would give this movie. I would give it a nine out of ten. I was, I was thinking of 9.5, but I'll stick with 9 out of 10. So I'll very quickly okay. read this. Uh, so I started reading this novel yesterday. It's called I Am Charlotte Simmons by Tom Wolfe. And in the prologue, it's very strange. You don't expect to see this in the prologue, but he gets into the idea of uh, neuroscience and, you know, sexual revolution and all this. And, you know, when we go to cafes now and when we go to bars, uh, if there's not a football match on, there's uh, just twerking and uh, animalistic behavior of human beings and it's um it's everywhere it's omnipresent and you have even cafes in the middle of nowhere or a bar in out in the sticks that have a massive screen and you'll just see uh, you know big arses being shaken and you know in the cafe you've got predominantly old people and maybe some small families etc so uh, i'll read this and then i'll pass it back so Victor Ransom Starling, U.S., Laureate Biological Sciences, 1997. 
a 28-year-old assistant professor of psychology at DuPont University, Starling conducted an experiment in 1983 in which he and an assistant surgically removed the amygdala, an almond-shaped mass of grey matter deep within the brain that controls emotions in the higher mammals, from 30 cats. It was well known that the procedure caused animals to veer helplessly from one inappropriate effect to another. Boredom where there should be fear, cringing where there should be preening, sexual arousal where there was nothing that would stimulate an intact animal. But Starling's amygdalectomized cats had gone into a state of sexual arousal hypermanic in the extreme. Cats attempted copulation with such frenzy a cat mounted on another cat would in turn or would be in turn mounted by a third cat and that one by yet another and so on, creating tandems colloquially called daisy chains as long as 10 feet. Starling called in a colleague to observe. The 30 amygdalectomized cats and 30 normal cats used as control as controls were housed in cages in the same room, one cat per cage. Starling set about opening cages so that the amygdalectomized cats might congregate on the floor. The first cat thus released sprang from its cage onto the visitor, embracing his ankle with its forelegs and convulsively thrusting its pelvis upon his shoe. Starling conjectured that the cat had smelled the leather of the shoe and in its excitement had mistaken it for a compatible animal, whereupon his assistant said, but Professor Starling, that's one of the controls. In that moment originated a discovery that has since radically altered the understanding of animal and human behavior. The existence, indeed pervasiveness, of cultural parastimuli the control cats have been able to watch the amygdalectomized cats from their cages. Over a period of weeks, they have become so thoroughly steeped in an environment of hypermanic sexual obsession that behavior induced surgically in the amygdalectomized cats had been induced in the controls without any intervention whatsoever. Starling had discovered that a strong social or cultural atmosphere even as abnormal as this one, could in time overwhelm the genetically determined responses of perfectly normal, healthy animals. 14 years later, Starling became the 20th member of the DuPont faculty, awarded the Nobel Prize. Okay, thanks for that. that's very interesting, yeah. And I, when you look at society now, as you said, when you look at it, it, it is hypersexualized, right? I mean, I don't. I, I used to go out on a weekend on a Saturday night down the town here, and I'm seeing 17, 18 year old girls, like with mini skirts. It doesn't matter how cold it is out there, right? They have got mini skirts up to their backsides, okay, and their boobs are sticking out and they're flaunting themselves. Uh, I heard now that there's a, a cocaine epidemic in Ireland. It's huge, okay? It's everywhere. And I, I've witnessed this myself by just going in to the toilets and I can hear people in the cubicle and you can hear them sniffing. You, you can hear them sniffing. I, I, I've heard this. So it, we really are in a kind of a pretty bad place right now. And I really do agree with E. Michael Jones on this one. I don't agree with him on everything, but I do agree that sexual uh, liberation is a form of political control. I think he's 100% spot on with that. Because once you let your animalistic emotions out, you can be controlled. It doesn't matter. It's kind of like get out there, do whatever. But as long as, you know, we can control you and you pay your taxes and you do whatever, uh, go along with the program. But we'll give you license to go out there and do whatever you want. Cut off your penis, uh, have a, you know, 
women can cut off their breasts, whatever. It, 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 you know, it, it's it's open season, and it, it's it's shocking to see that. Um, but regards back to the, back to this film, uh, I think it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, another Kubrick classic. I think Kubrick is probably one of my favorite directors out there. He's Jewish, I know. But uh, I, I, I'd have to ask you, actually, both of you, is he one of the good guys or the bad guys? I, I'd like to know what your thoughts on that are. But I think he does, he does put it out there for people to think. He's a very, obviously a very intelligent guy, puts in a lot of symbolism in there, a lot of clues in there. And that's why we did a deep analysis of this film today. Because, and I think it was great. We, you know, we, we went a, a long time on this one. And I'm sure we can do probably more Kubrick films because for me, that this guy is this guy is one of the best, and I think he went too far with eyes wide shut, and that's why I think they took him out. I really do think they did take him out, and um, you know, to die a few days later of a heart attack when he had actually no heart issues at all. I think he was he was 70, 70 something like that, which is in this day and age not that old, um, and then just to suddenly die of a heart attack, uh, I don't buy that. I think he pushed the envelope too far. They cut out the 30 minutes. Uh, he he obviously saw what was going on in Hollywood. This, that upset him, so he pushed it out there, and um, and that had to be uh, taken out. And they said, "Sorry, Stanley, you went too far." And uh, yeah, he wasn't redeemed, was he? No, poor old Stanley was redeemed. So. Uh, Marks out of ten. I, I'm going to nine point five. In fact, I'd probably even go ten. I think this is this is a, a, a fantastic film. Very dark, very disturbing. Uh, don't watch it before you go to bed. You know, it's not a scary movie, but there's there's evil lurking in there, and Kubrick knows how to do it. He he just he put it all in there. Temptation, desire, seduction. And it all comes down to, at the end of the day, consent. Do you consent? Because if you consent, well, we'll offer you the world. If you don't, well, you can go off and do your own world. We all have a choice. And that's the way I think of it. So um, did we do it around Blackbird? No. No, Blackbird, finish. you didn't finish up. Yeah, no, you, 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 didn't, you didn't give your thoughts, no? Okay. Sorry, yeah, I jumped I, in there. Jeez, sorry about that. Anyway. Oh, no problem. Uh, yeah. I guess I give this a nine or a nine five, you know, because mm -hmm. there's just so much in here. It's just incredibly well done. You can spend, you know, months picking through all the symbolism in this movie. And it's interesting what he had to say about it, that he felt it was... Uh, quote, his greatest contribution to the art of cinema. So of all the things he did, he thought this was his masterpiece. And, you know, looking at the way Kubrick operated, and you go into the idea of meta art, that, okay, Kubrick is a Jewish uh, guy beholding to that Jewish Talmudic power system. The guy who wrote the original novel, Arthur Schnitzler, was also a hardcore Jewish guy who you know, bought into that Jewish Talmudic system. And it's interesting, the National Socialists, you know, burned his books as pornography when the, you know, when the uh, Hitler youth burned those pornography books. This was one of them. You know, so uh, the idea of the dream, was it the dream story? You know, that was considered, you know, just pornographic Jewish porn or just you know, degenerate uh, uh, crap, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but part of that you know, Jewish system is the law of Mashira. And people don't understand how serious this is. Mashira law basically says, you may not report the crimes of another Jew to a Gentile court. You must never, ever expose the Jews. If you do that, you are called a Moser, and every Jew is not only allowed, but is obligated to hunt you down and kill you 
the most painful way possible, right? That make you pay for what you have done. It is a death sentence to expose Jewish criminality. And when I saw that that piece of artwork, the burning of Aunt uh, Gertie or whatever, um, you know, that that was in the hospital uh, when they were going to look at the dead prostitute or high priestess, uh, you know, Aunt Gertie burning, you know, my question is, did uh, Kubrick know what he was doing and said, I'm going to do it anyway. And so he did this film, released it to a private showing of family, his Jewish family and the people of the film. And six days later, he was dead as reported heart attack. Yeah. You know, so my question is, did he deliberately do this knowing that these people would have no choice but to take him out for doing it, All right? And in that way, exposing the system at that meta level, that mm -hmm. I have exposed the system through my death. Right, and so every every artist wants a you know spectacular death scene at the end, right? And so for Kubrick, I could see him, you know, manipulating his own people into killing him as his final act of meta cinema, if you will. Uh, that's just kind of my take on it. But yes, I definitely give this a nine to a nine point five, and I have really enjoyed this. Uh, mm review uh deep dive on this you gentlemen just, just really yeah, pulled just, it just ask you out. would you think uh, kubrick was good jew bad jew what 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 what's your thoughts on that you know because we have this argument whether it was good jews out there well i just uh, see I that he you know was a jewish supremacist that thought goyim were stupid and he was an artist he was you know uh, he walked in the circles of this elite and mm. Uh, I don't think he was our guy by any means. I mm -hmm. think he did a lot to expose that yeah. hidden world, that you know, mm -hmm. land of Nod, east of Eden, to mm -hmm. people and part, you know, little bites that they could accept because this is such an alien world. And I think he did it, but you know, I don't see him ever saying that this system is wrong or bad or that you know. Uh, white Christians should be you know, living yeah. uh, ruling civilization because yeah. I think he had a lot of contempt for white Europeans and mm -hmm. Christianity especially. Yeah. Uh, but so that's just my take on it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys, listen, that was a, that was a great analysis of this film. And, um, um, and again, with regards to Kubrick, I, I think again, I, I would tend to agree with you. He never called out uh, the control system. I think he just, Put it out there for the goyim and said, "Listen, telling us this is what they're doing. Now it's up to you to figure it out. If people don't figure it out, well, that's your tough luck, isn't it?" So, and unfortunately, a lot of people are. You know, they're uh, they, they're 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 pointing fingers a lot, but they're not actually going to the the roots of the actual problem. But anyway, I'll leave it at that because we could go on for ages. Thanks, guys, for this. Uh, very very enjoyable. We'll do another one. I'm sure we could do another Kubrick film again at some point. And um, yeah, we'll talk again, okay? Thanks very much.